and White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card. A House Government Reform Subcommittee recently looked at the security of nuclear weapon facilities within the Energy Department. Last week, department officials and General Accounting Office personnel testified at this three-hour hearing chaired by Connecticut Congressman Chris Shays. being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations hearing entitled Emerging Threats, Assessing Nuclear Weapons Complex Facility Security is called to order. From its humble beginnings as the Manhattan Project in the distant New Mexi Mexico desert, the nation's nuclear weapons program has always posed daunting security challenges. Today, the far-flung complex of warhead production plants, research laboratories, test facilities, and former weapon sites stands as an undeniably attractive target for spies and terrorists bent on using their own technologies against us. Even before the attacks of September 11, 2001, forced a reevaluation of physical security standards and procedures, serious questions arose concerning lax management and a stubborn cultural antipathy to protect me protective measures at sites housing plutonium and highly enriched uranium. In response, Congress established the National Na Nuclear Security Administration, referred to as the NS NNSA, as a semi-autonomous agency within the Department of Energy, DOE, to focus resources and high-level management attention on security mandates. But creation of the NNSA failed to stem persistent reports of security lapses and inattentiveness to lingering vulnerabilities throughout the weapons complex. So the subcommittee asked the General Accounting Office, GAO, to evaluate DOE and NNSA management of material safeguards and facility security programs. Of particular interest was how DOE assures contractor adherence to security policies. The GAO findings released today lead to this sobering conclusion. The stern new realities of the post-9-11 world have been far too slow to penetrate the hardened bureaucratic maze of DOE offices, contractors, and sites. It took two years for DOE to update the fundamental assessment governing nuclear weapons security. The Design Basis Threat, or DBT, formally adopted in May, the new more stringent DBT will not be fully reflected in budget plans until 2005. And more of concern, security enhancements demanded by the new DBT will not be completed before 2009, if then. Even the process of completing the GAO, GAO study under discussion today was needlessly delayed by DOE refusal to provide access to drafts of the DBT, drafts openly relied upon to justify earlier budget submissions. DOE eventually provided the documents to Congress's audit agency, and we hope that level of cooperation will continue as we pursue our investigation. GAO has found a lack of clear roles and responsibilities among NNSA security offices, inconsistent assessments of contractor performance, potentially critical staff short shortfalls, and a failure to address the root causes of security lapses. As a result, Neither the Department of Energy nor the NNSA can yet provide reasonable assurance weapons-grade material is protected against a determined, well-trained adversarial force willing to die in a nuclear detonation or radiological dispersion of their own making. This morning, we will hear testimony on the process of updating 
and administrating security standards at the nation's nuclear weapons complex. Classified elements of the security and safeguards program will be discussed at a closed session this afternoon. Our, willingness, our witnesses today all bring impressive experience and important expertise to our continuing oversight <coughs> of nuclear security. They also share a dedication to improve national security and public safety, and we look forward to a constructive dialogue on these important issues. Before recognizing Mr. Turner, let me just apologize for being a little late. I got in to Andrews Air Force Base at about 2.30 last night, so. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you again for your efforts in uh, leadership in addressing the issue of our national security and the threats uh, that are posed uh, by, by issues of, of possible targets of terrorist attacks. Our national labs and nuclear production facilities are appealing targets for terrorists. These sites are challenges to secure, spread over <coughs> large parcels of land, and contain some of the most deadly materials known to man. Terrorists now use once unimaginable tactics to cause death and destruction, and we must now account for the possibility that terrorists will sacrifice their own lives to carry out their missions. And the thought of terrorists attempting to steal plutonium or highly enriched uranium is no longer related to Tom Clancy novels, but is a real-life threat. I'm particularly interested in hearing how we can make the NNSA more responsive and flexible to the threats facing our weapons complexes, and it should not take months and years to develop security procedures. The real world does not work this way. Terrorists do not work this way, and the ground-level security pe personnel do not think this way. I look forward to hearing our witnesses' testimony. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, and recognize Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this uh, very important hearing. Um, I don't have a formal written statement uh, or opening statement, but uh, uh, I do want to say that um, I don't represent uh, the facility at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but uh, slightly over half the people who work there live in my district. And so uh, this is a subject of great concern to me and my constituents. And uh, I'm particularly interested to know if there are any uh, problems or shortcomings at the facility at Oak Ridge. But uh, I'll just, I've come here mainly to try to learn about this and what the problem is and what the extent of it is. And I thank you for calling this hearing. Thank the gentleman for um, participating and for his, uh, and both gentlemen's uh, good work on this committee. Uh, just a few housekeeping before recognizing our panel. I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Without objection, so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the subcommittee meet in closed session at 2 p.m. today to hear testimony and classified aspects of the issues under discussion today without objection, so ordered. So we'll do that at 2 o'clock today. I'm going to um, call on the first panel, first recognize them, and uh, then have um, Mr. Turner take over and conduct this hearing. Uh, our first uh, panel is uh, comprised of uh, Mr. Robin M. Nazaro, Director, National Resources and Environmental uh, and, and Environment, U.S. General Accounting Office. Accompanied from the same uh, division uh, is James Noel, Assistant Director, Nash, uh, and also Jonathan M. Gill, the evaluator. And then the second testimony from this panel will be from uh, Glenn Podonsky, Director, Office of Oversight and Performance Assurance, referred to as OA, from the Department of, of Energy. And if um, you would uh, please rise, we'll swear you in, and we'll start the testimony. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative, and uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Nazaro. Uh, Mr. Chair. Let me just say we have five minutes, uh, but we roll over for another five minutes. Uh, so you would have technically ten, but we prefer you stop somewhere between the five and the ten. But it is important that we put uh, your document on the record, so if you need to pull ten, feel free to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to be here today to discuss physical security of the nuclear weapons complex at the Department of Energy. 
and the National Nuclear Security Administration within DOE. Currently, the nuclear complex includes four production sites, three national laboratories that design nuclear weapons, and a number of former nuclear weapons sites that contain nuclear weapons materials. To ensure the physical security of the complex, DOE and NNSA rely on their safeguards and security program. A key component of DOE's protective strategy is the design basis threat, which identifies the characteristics of the potential threats to DOE. To implement their safeguards and security program, DOE and NNSA rely on contractors to conduct day-to-day -day activities subject to DOE and NNSA oversight. Over the past decade, we and others have raised concern about the adequacy of security at nuclear weapons facilities within the Department and NNSA. In addition, the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 highlighted the importance of effective physical security in response to a challenging and well-organized terrorist threat. In this context, my testimony today focuses on two issues. First, how NNSA manages its safeguards and security program, and second, DOE's response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. In summary, Mr. Chairman, we found that NNSA has not been fully effective in managing its safeguards and security program in the following four key areas. First, NNSA had not fully defined clear roles and responsibilities for its headquarters and site operations. Since its creation in March 2000, NNSA's management structure has been in a state of flux. As a result, NNSA site office officials said that each office is carrying out oversight activities as it deems appropriate. Second, <coughs> as a result of the lack of clarity in NNSA's management structure, NNSA site offices have not been consistent in how they assess contractor safeguards and security activities. Consequently, NNSA cannot be assured that all facilities are subject to the comprehensive annual assessment that DOE policy requires. Third, once problems are identified, NNSA contractors do not consistently conduct the analyses DOE policy requires in preparing corrective action plans. The corrective actions are developed without fully considering the problem's root causes, the risks posed, or the cost versus benefit of taking corrective action. Thus, potential opportunities to improve physical security at the sites are not maximized. And lastly, NNSA site offices have shortfalls in the total number of staff and in the expertise for effectively overseeing contractors. This could make it more difficult for site offices to effectively oversee security activities. Site officials said that they will fill some vacancies through a virtual organization. However, it will take time to work through some of the difficulties associated with making the transition to this approach. As a result, NNSA cannot be assured that its contractors are working to maximum advantage to protect critical facilities and materials from adversaries seeking to afflict damage. In our May report, we made four recommendations to address these problems that are designed to improve NNSA's security management and oversight. Since the issuance of our report, NNSA has made progress in addressing the problems we identified, including publishing a Safeguards and Security Functions, Responsibilities and Authorities Manual, and developing and issuing guidance for corrective action plans. Beyond these changes, sound safeguards and security management will have to play a key role in helping DOE and NNSA adjust to the post-September 11th security environment. Uh, before I take this, the second issue on, do you want me to break then? Here would be a good place. No, please, please continue. continue. Okay. I would now like to discuss DOE and NNSA's response to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. In this regard, we examined three issues, DOE's and NNSA's immediate response to the attacks, DOE's efforts to develop the design basis threat document, and the challenges DOE and NNSA face in meeting the requirements of the new DBT. DOE and NNSA took immediate steps to improve security in the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. For example, DOE and NNSA moved to a higher level of security that required, among other things, more vehicle inspections and security patrols. 
DOE and NNSA also conducted a number of security-related reviews, studies, and analyses, and increased communication with federal, state, and local officials. While these steps are believed to have improved DOE and NNSA's security posture, they have been expensive. These steps have required extensive overtime, which has had a considerable negative effect on DOE's and NNSA's protective force through fatigue, reduced readiness, retention, and reduced training. Furthermore, until fully evaluated, the effectiveness of these measures is uncertain. Based on the number and capabilities of the terrorists involved in the September 11 attacks, DOE and NNSA officials realized that the then current DBT, which was issued in 1999, and based on a 1998 intelligence community assessment, was obsolete. However, formally recognizing these new threats by updating the DBT has been difficult. DOE's effort to develop and issue a new DBT took almost two years. It was issued just last month. The effort to develop a new DBT was slowed by, among other things, disagreements over the size of the potential terrorist group that might attack a DOE or NNSA facility and how much it would cost to meet the new threat. Implementation of the new DBT will be challenging. Successfully addressing the increased threats will take time and resources, as well as sound management, leadership, and new ways of doing business. Currently, DOE does not have a reliable estimate of the cost to fully protect DOE and NNSA facilities against the new DBT. Further, once funds become available, most sites estimate that it will take from two to five years to fully implement, test, validate, and refine strategies for meeting the new DBT requirements. Meeting these challenges will require DOE and NNSA to provide sustained sound management for their safeguards and security program. Given the materials DOE and NNSA possess, physical security at DOE and NSA facilities cannot fail. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I would be happy to respond to any questions you or the members may have. Thank you, Mr. Noel. No, it's Mr. Sorry. Mr. Podolsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to testify today. My Office of Independent Oversight is responsible for evaluating the Department's Environment, Safety and Health, Safeguard and Security, and Cybersecurity programs at the Department. We report directly to the Secretary of Energy and have no responsibilities for either managing DOE sites or developing policy. Consequently, we perform assessments independent of programs and provide unbiased information to the Secretary, the NNSA Administrator, and other DOE line managers. My testimony today will focus on the current status of security programs at nuclear weapons production sites and the National Weapons Laboratories. It is important to note that some of the current problems in the DOE security program are driven by events that occurred in the mid-90s when budgets for security were cut significantly. These cuts resulted in reductions in protective forces and decisions not to upgrade or replace security hardware. In the 98 timeframe, independent oversight reviews and other external assessments revealed that the security cuts had gone too far at some sites. Protection effectiveness was not where it needed to be. At DOE's direction, sites began rebuilding their protection programs. The tragic events of September 11th happened at a time when DOE was still rebuilding its protection programs. Since then, DOE has increased security through a number of measures and has reassessed the design basis threat. However, these represent only the first steps in enhancing DOE security. Historically, roles and responsibilities for security have been unclear in some areas and too fragmented for effective operation in others. Secretary Abraham and Ambassador Brooks are addressing the overall management structure for security, but much remains to be done before DOE has a coherent management structure in place to support an effective corporate approach to security. Our assessment of the current security posture is based on inspections we have conducted during the past two years, which included most major NNSA sites and laboratories. Our inspections include extensive performance testing, 
For example, we have been conducting much more aggressive large-scale force-on-force performance tests of physical security using our own adversary team for years. The 9-11 events prompted us to redouble our efforts. Since then, we have substantially increased the number of tests we perform and strengthened our adversaries' team by adding real-world experts with, uh, and rigorous training. At the direction of Secretary Abraham, we are initiating a DOE-wide review of protective force operations to assess the current effectiveness of post-9-11 enhancements. Our inspections and performance tests have documented some positive aspects as well as a number of weaknesses, some of which are longstanding and require substantially more attention. On the positive side, many improvements have resulted from the increased security measures put in place following 9-11. DOE sites have hired more protective force personnel and increased the number of protective force members on duty at any given time. They have added additional barriers and hardened fighting positions. Classified cyber operations have also been made, been made more secure. Additionally, Secretary Abraham personally directed that the design basis threat be further strengthened after it was submitted for his review. The final design basis threat, which was issued May 20th, provides the basis for establishing and assessing protection effectiveness at DOE sites. Notwithstanding these positive aspects, our inspections have also documented a number of weaknesses. The recent hiring of additional protective force personnel has been responsive to the heightened security levels. However, DOE sites continue to rely on the use of overtime until new hires are cleared and trained to perform their duties. As a result, protective force personnel testing and training have been reduced or deferred because existing manpower is stretched to the limit. DOE sites have primarily responded to the need to enhance security by using manpower intensive measures. More effective solutions can be gained by enhancing the integration of manpower and technology through increased use of barriers and force multipliers, consolidating security assets, improving manpower deployment to protect vital assets, and making greater use of performance tests. It is clear that every site has increased its level of protection in response to 9-11 attacks. However, few of these enhanced protection schemes have been fully performance tested or formally evaluated. Unclassified cybersecurity continues to be a challenge for many sites. There are recurring deficiencies regarding controls of foreign nationals on DOE computer systems. Additionally, some sites have not fully recognized or addressed the risk associated with the proliferation of wireless computer technology. Weakness in feedback and improvement processes and clarity of security roles and responsibilities are longstanding concerns, both within the DOE line and contractor organizations. Progress in these areas have been inconsistent and sporadic. The NNSA reorganization places increased responsibility on site offices. However, at this time, not all sites have the staffing and expertise necessary to fully and effectively discharge their security oversight responsibility. The Secretary, Deputy Secretary, and NNSA Administrator have placed significant emphasis on reorganizing the management structure to clarify responsibilities and increase accountability. They have demonstrated personal involvement in enhancing security after 9-11 and in response to the very recent security lapses. The current efforts are promising, but need significant continued attention and evaluation to ensure that the intended improvements are realized at the field level. In closing, the department is making some progress, but much more work is needed to upgrade and vigorously test site programs to meet the new design basis threat, to crystallize security-related roles and responsibilities throughout the department, and apply program and performance feedback in continuously improving our overall security posture. The strong and aggressive focus of the Secretary and the NNSA Administrator must be sustained in order to satisfy the increasingly complex and continually changing security challenges that face the DOE and our nation. Thank you. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that uh, Mr. Dennis Kucinich from Ohio and um, Mr. Ron Lewis from Kentucky have joined us and uh, we'll begin our questions uh, with a five minute round and our first questions will be asked by Mr. John Duncan of Tennessee. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a little less than a month ago, the Knoxville News Sentinel had a story under the headline DOE, again, thumbs nose at external safety regulation. And the story says this is not a new story, of course. Critics have skewered DOE's self-regulating status for years, and the GAO has issued regular <coughs> reports showing how external regulation could <coughs> improve safety, accountability, and God's sake, save money, too. In its newest findings, the GAO said shifting to outside regulation could save DOE as much as $41 million annually. In its response, DOE questioned the cost estimates and the quality of GAO's research data. The GAO countered with this biting conclusion. At this point, with the analysis undertaken on this issue over the years, it seems to us that philosophical opposition rather than data limitations is the main stumbling block to the Department's shift to external regulation. Indeed, same song, slightly new verse. Uh, is, is that an accurate uh, story, Ms. Nassaro? And, and, uh, would you care to comment on that? And then I'll ask Mr. Podonsky if he wants to say something. Um, I would say yes, it is an accurate story. I mean, GAO does stand by our analyses as far as the, the dollar savings, uh, which was the only thing that Ms. was questioned. Ms. Could, could you please uh, come a little closer to the microphone so we can all hear you? Okay. Um, we, we have reported, as you said, for years on the benefits of external regulation. Uh, we continue to be supportive of that concept. Uh, and this was the first year that we had done some comparison as far as potential dollar savings and have compared it against a pilot project actually that was done um, using uh, data from another, another agency and uh, stand by those numbers. Mr. Podonsky. Uh, Congressman, uh, I would have to defer that answer to the department uh, for response. Uh, since we do independent oversight of the department, uh, we have not actually looked at what the effects would be if, if there was an external regulator. <coughs> Let me ask you this. Uh, the NNSA was created in March of 2000, and that was uh, a year and a half before the events of 9-11. What, what was accomplished uh, in that uh, year and a half? Uh, you, you said something about uh, shifting management and so forth. Was nothing done? and, and then this DBT thing, design basis threat. I have to say whoever came up with that sure came up with a bureaucratic title. Uh, but it took two years to issue uh, this DBT. Why, why did that take so long? And, and what, what were we not doing before in regard to security uh, that we are doing now? Can either one of you answer some of these questions? Ms. I, I can Nazar. start. There was a, pr a previous design basis threat document. This isn't a new document within the department. It, it was, there was a design basis threat document that was developed in 1999 based on a 1998 assessment. This was an updated one based on the events of September 11th. DOE decided it needed to update the prior design basis threat. Because even what though, it addresses even, is even though we had a report out in 99, it took them two years to come up with a report after 9-11 to Correct. update that. Correct. There, there were disagreements on the cost it was going to take, what level of risk DOE was willing to take, um, and what exactly the threat was. What the, the new design basis threat document lays out is the level of risk and the level of threat. What is the threat as far as an adversary? And there was disagreement within the department on what that threat would be. And, and well, I know from living near Oak Ridge, there's always been security out there. And and what I'm wondering about is, you know, we had a, this report you said came out, this DBT report came out in 99, and then now we've got an updated one. What I'm wondering about is what are we doing now? Part of what I'm wondering about is what are we doing now that we weren't doing before all these reports have come out? What changes have been made? I might be able to answer that. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Uh, the difference between the old design basis threat, DBT, and the new ones, without going into classified, the numbers have changed, the numbers meaning what the department is protecting against. Uh, to be a more realistic with real events today, uh, it formalizes. Yeah, the, you, when you say the numbers have changed, are you talking about the numbers of security personnel? No, sir. We're talking yeah. about the design basis threat is, right. a, is a tool by which the security uh, is is focusing on what it is protecting against. 
Uh, oh. So how many adversaries do you need to protect against? I see. Uh, because various threats would require different numbers. And part of this is, is, is truly for economics as well as security. You can make something so secure that you don't function any longer. Right. So there has to be a balance between your mission as well as security. And what the new DBT did, uh, it formalized uh, increased numbers, considering what we all ex saw at 9-11. And it also formalized protection requirements against radiological dispersal as well as dispersal chemical agents. So it, it, it took a look at other threats that were not previously considered under all old regimens. All right, well, I've got some more questions, but my time's up for this round, so yield Mr. back. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. Uh, I have some uh, questions for Mr. Kuransky. Uh, according to uh, information from the Department of Energy, the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration in 2003 uh, estimates that they'll spend $7.9 billion for their work. Is that correct? Um, you'd have to ask the NNSA. I, I have no knowledge of what they were to be spending. Okay, do you want to tell me about the work of your department specifically in relationship to this program? Uh, uh, my, my office, uh, Congressman, is responsible to the Secretary and the NNSA Administrator for evaluating environment, safety, health, safeguards and security, cybersecurity, and emergency management programs at the department. We evaluate them against their requirements, but we performance test them to make sure that they are doing what they are funded to do. For example, in security area, we test the security forces, we look at material control accountability, we look at classified and unclassified cybersecurity, we look at pers personnel security, we look at all the aspects of the performance of the DOE and the NNSA. And then we report on that to both the inside the department and also to interested committees up here on the Hill. Now, uh, there are watchdog groups such as the Project on Government Oversight that has alleged that uh, force on force and simulated tests of nuclear facilities are dumbed down to show that security forces are adequately prepared to meet the threat. For instance, it's been alleged that security forces are given the time and in one reported instance, even the plan of attack. Attackers are placed under artificial constraints that slow them down or otherwise limit their uh, capabilities. As part of your work on this project or from your experience doing other work, have you seen this happen? Uh, the answer to that is in some cases, yes, we have seen where there has been questionable in the past, in past years, questionable whether scenarios were shared or not shared. The reality, however, uh, is today I would say that we have not seen dumbed-down tests. On the contrary, we've seen very aggressive, including our own, very aggressive force on force exercises. The thing that's important to but realize... Can you say when you've seen those? Have you personally witnessed that or you personally... I've only heard accounts of those back in the 97, 98 time frame. So you, so you don't know from your own experience? In terms of dumbed-down testing? Right. No, sir. And do you know from your own experience about the quality of testing right now? Yes, I do. And do you think that uh, the DOE has determined the design uh, basis threat based on actual threat to the facilities, or is it uh, influenced by budgetary constraints? Uh, we believe that the design basis threat today is a very aggressive, robust uh, threat statement. Uh, we do have two concerns that I'll be happy to talk about under uh, closed classified session. But overall, we think given today's threat in the world, uh, the DOE has a very high mountain that it's created, and we think it's very uh, appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, we, you know, I have here a, uh, a copy of a, an attachment that includes a uh, Department of Energy budget. I think it would be interesting for the people of this country to know that uh, nearly $8 billion is estimated to be spent on National Nuclear Security Administration. And that uh, environmental management, which does in include a certain amount of cleanup, is uh, scheduled to be about uh, $7 billion. Nuclear waste disposal, about $591 uh, billion or million. Uh, when you look at, at this overall budget, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, there's a question that, uh, isn't, uh, uh, that just needs to be raised in the context of this hearing, and that is the policy of our government with respect to building nuclear weapons in the first place. 
And while uh, this is about the threat that derives from having produced such weapons, it appears that the weapons that we're producing, far from being a threat to, to other nations, end up being a threat to ourselves. Just a little thought for today. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Ms. Nassaro and, and uh, Mr. Pononsky, yeah, right. how adequately staffed uh, are DOE and NSA for ensuring safeguards and security at the nuclear weapons uh, complex sites? In, in regards to staffing, the issue we looked at was staffing uh, as it relates to oversight, yes. and that's where we found that there was a deficiency uh, as far as capabilities to conduct oversight of the contractors. Uh, DOE's response has been that it will use this virtual organization whereby they would use individuals from other locations to conduct oversight. Um, however, we do have concerns that the staffing certainly is inadequate and they do have a number of vacancies that need to be filled. But we looked at it only in, in that aspect. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pinonsky, what does what, uh, uh, DOE and uh, NSA uh, doing about uh, the staffing problem? Uh, to the uh, NNSA and DOE's credit, they have increased uh, the uh, personnel in terms of security guard force, which was very important. Uh, relative to uh, staffing at the sites for, as, as Ms. Nazaro was talking about, the self-assessment oversight, the programmatic oversight, uh, they're, uh, they're taking a very rigorous approach to try and find more staff. Uh, we fully agree with the GAO uh, from an oversight pers uh, from an independent oversight perspective that there is a need, a very serious need at all the site offices uh, to beef up the staffing with qualified, uh, capable uh, folks to oversee the contractors as well as the contractors to oversee themselves. And, and what's the problem in getting the staffing up to par? Uh, finding qualified people, or what's, what's the problem? Well, you'd have to ask the uh, NNSA or DOE directly, but I would give you our opinion from independent oversight, which is there are a lot of competing concerns for security in the country today. And, and it's very difficult, I know, in my own organization to maintain and keep very highly qualified national level experts in the security business. And to attract them into government service is quite difficult because the salaries are, are not necessarily as attractive as they are in the private sector. Okay, thank you. I yield back my time, thanks. Mr. Chairman. I thank you all for being here. Let me ask you, uh, uh, Ms. Nazaro and uh, Mr. Podonsky, uh, how do you find adequate security? And let me just say, we're talking about security in our, our labs, our production facilities, our test sites, and the closed down environmental sites. And, and how would you define adequate security? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very... Uh, and maybe in your answer you can tell me the different kinds of security we're talking about. Well, uh, at the Department uh, of Energy, uh, security has been a focus uh, through various uh, ebbs and flow in time. Uh, back in the 70s, it was uh, heavily uh, focused on, and there were changes that were made. Uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, safety was focused on. In the 90s, uh, more safety. And, and then, of course, uh, post 9-11, security was focused on again. And I would just tell you that adequate security really depends on what is being protected. Uh, and from our standpoint, this, the department now, more than ever, is focusing on providing appropriate security while still trying to maintain its mission. Um, if you talk to security professionals, they would, they would give you an answer that may be uh, unacceptable in terms of what type of budgets would have to be spent to provide the adequate security that they may, may need. Uh, it's similar to uh, what TSA is going through at the airports. How, much security, how many security screeners do you need? What's appropriate for, for what you're trying to do? And the airlines would tell you that they're trying to uh, make sure the passengers make it to their airplanes on time. In the Department of Energy, we have different sites, different categories of protection, and the security and the design basis threat that we've talked about here is tailored to meet those needs. Um, Again, I would say that the adequacy is difficult to pinpoint down because it changes dependent on what the target is and what you're trying to protect and what your mission is. 
Without getting into any classified information, um, what we would look at is, is two levels. One, there are a number of assessments that are performed to look at the adequacy of security, both surveys and surveillance that DOE uses. And we would expect that those would be clean assessments, uh, you know, and that any action plans that were um, identified as a result would be addressed. Uh, second, they do identify a level of risk and DOE does have various levels of risk and we would expect those to be at the lowest level as set out in DOE's policy. Tell me, if we don't have adequate security, what are the potentials that could be used by governments, um, their spy networks, uh, or uh, by terrorists to, I want to know why this matters. It may seem obvious, a question, but I want someone to kind of articulate it. Why does all this matter? Well, the, the, there's certainly a number of threats. I mean, one being theft of nuclear weapons and or materials, um, also sabotage uh, at the sites themselves. Um, certainly within a terrorist environment, um, you've got people who are willing to die uh, to go and, and actually detonate these at the sites. So, but just going from your, uh, from your uh, response, we're talking about uh, the potential that someone could actually get a, a, nuclear, a nuclear weapon. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, we're talking about the fact that they could get weapons-grade material. Correct. Okay. And we're talking about the fact that they could come on site and sabotage the sites. Correct. Okay. And we're also talking about the fact that they could potentially cause a radioactive uh, catastrophe or, or a, a nuclear explosion? At the sites, correct. Yeah. So that's why we care about this. Yes, sir. Uh, and obviously, if someone were to, we're also concerned with countries, other countries, getting the technology that uh, in many cases they may not have at all or that they may be 10 or 20 years behind us. Is that also a factor? Yes. Okay. Um, when you did this report, uh, I was, some of it seems, um, I don't want to say technical in that sense. I want to say that I was wondering if we were um, uh, swallowing camels and straining out gnats. Uh, when when uh, DOE looks at this, do they do? Is there a response to you that, you know what? I will. Um, I'll come back after you've had your round. I'll, I'll come back for my round. Okay. I want to follow up on this question. My time is up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's very important that you were asking the question, why does this matter? Because if you look at the report that we have in front of us, <clears throat> um, it, it certainly does not reflect the. I think what people in our country would consider the, the severity of the issue or, or the attention level um, that, that this deserves, not just of the threat uh, to, to Americans, but of the possibility um, of the, the threat to others, of, um, of technology, of, um, uh, of even other countries being uh, threatened uh, by materials that we have uh, through individuals that, that might seek them. <clears throat> in, um, in looking at Ms. Nazaro's uh, statement, you have issues such as stating you know, defining clear roles and responsibilities is, is not been effectively done. Assessing site security uh, activities uh, need to be um, uh, addressed. Overseeing con contractors' corrective actions, allocating staff, all issues of problems. When you look at, at issues of our um, nuclear materials, you would expect that we'd be able to use words such as proactive and advanced. And what we're clearly seeing in the materials in front of us is um, our words such as slow and incomplete. Um, the, um, and, and, and I'm just wondering if you look through this, and clearly it's, it's unacceptable. So you have to ask yourself, is it an issue of structure? Is it an issue of people just don't understand the severity of the issue in, in front of them? Is it a performance issue? So I'd like Ms. Nazaro and Mr. Panofsky to tell us, I mean, I'm certain that this is not acceptable to you, that in reading this, you agree that this is, is not where we would want to be, and, and this, is, um, this is concerning for, for all of us. Where is the problem? Now, other than just saying the problem needs to be fixed, is it structure? Is it um, understanding the mission? Um, 
or is it just a straight out performance issue and that someone needs to be held accountable there? The, the report you have in front of you addressed management and oversight issues uh, as far as DOE and NNSA um, overseeing the activities of the contractors. Some of the things that you're getting into would be more contractor performance issues, which we have not yet addressed, uh, and that will be the subject of follow-on work, actually, that uh, Congressman Shays has asked us to do. Uh, as far as the, the, the issues, though, at hand, you're still talking about safeguarding and protecting the nuclear complex, and given the kinds of materials that they are in charge of protecting, you know, this is something that is critical to the country. I mean, if you don't have adequate management and oversight of the contractors, you're going to see problems with the contractors as well. So I don't think it minimizes by saying these are the kinds of problems we're seeing. Um, it, it certainly is the overarching issue of whether you're even overseeing or managing what the contractors are doing. So what I take it from your answer that, that you, you in, in looking at it as a management oversight, it's a performance, it's an agency performance issue um, at this point, you believe, or you're, you're indicating that you think additional information has to be given for you to, to define why is this continuing to be a problem? No, as far as DOE, certainly we have seen ongoing problems for some time since the creation of NNSA. As we said, this has been an agency in flux, and we have seen uh, problems as far as defining roles and responsibilities where it's not clear who's supposed to do what. And basically, what we have heard from the site offices is that they're all doing their own thing. Mr. Podonsky? I would uh, start out by saying uh, many of the items in the GAO report, uh, the independent oversight, does in fact agree with. However, I think it's important to note that Secretary Abraham and Ambassador Brooks are aggressively taking steps that have never been taken before in the department as long as I've been there, which is going on, unfortunately, about 19 years of overseeing this <coughs> behemoth organization. And the steps that they're taking is they're finally somebody is being held accountable. We're seeing this at our national laboratories. We're seeing this at the sites. Uh, if you ask Congressman what's at the root cause, uh, I would tell you that my organization, after observing and writing reports on these very issues for many years, would tell you that the roles and responsibilities have not already always been clear, and the accountability, which is critical part, has not always been taken uh, where people were held accountable for those jobs that they hold. So it is a performance a aspect uh, as well as management, but I would again iterate the Secretary and the Ambassador are taking steps, uh, which we are seeing firsthand. Uh, we have teams out at some of the um, uh, NNSA sites right now at the bequest of the uh, Ambassador. Um, now, how that trickles down to the other managers in the security profession, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road, and we think that's where further accountability has to be made. Thank you. Going to a second round of, of questions then. Mr. Duncan. Let me um, just ask this. Um, you know, anytime any government agency, I don't care what department or agency it is, anytime they mess up, they always come in and say it's because of lack of funding or not enough money. And yet we've had 10 or 15 years of l very low inflation. In fact, the Federal Reserve is worried about deflation now. We've probably had 25 or 30 percent inflation over these last 10 years. And yet whenever you look at these agencies and ask what they're spending or compared to 10 years ago, they're at 60 and 100 and uh, percent over what they were 10 years ago. I remember when the INS was criticized because they let all the hijackers in, they said they didn't have enough money. And we checked and they'd gotten a 250 percent increase in funding over the previous eight years, which, I, I mean, it just boggles my mind that we hear this over and over again. But, uh, and now I, I hear that the NNSA, which was just started in 2000, March of 2000, has a $7.9 billion budget. And I, you know, that's, I'm, I'm all for saving all the money we can, but, you know, and now we're acting like uh, that we're not doing enough in security. And Mr. Podonsky just said that we're doing uh, far more than, we, than at any time in his 19 years at the department. And I'm just wondering, I, you know, I, <coughs> I don't want to scare people and think that we're not doing enough at these nuclear weapons facilities. And I'm curious about, several things. Uh, 
I, I read several times, I read different uh, numbers uh, when uh, about the Iraqi war and that uh, uh, there were 23 or 25 uh, countries that have weapons of mass destruction. Does anybody on this panel know how many countries have nuclear weapons? How many countries there are that have nuclear weapons facilities? Do any of you know that? That's, I wouldn't have a total number, no, sir. Do, it, it, well, what I'm getting at, is there any country uh, in the world that's doing more in regard to nuclear weapons facility security than we are? Or, it, or any country that's doing even close to as much as we are? Surely somebody knows that question. I, I would believe that, uh, that this country is doing probably the most uh, of any Probably nation. by far. By far, yes, sir. And, and I don't, I'm not really clear on this. The NNSA budget, which is $7.9 and is all pertaining supposedly to security because it's, I mean, that's what it's set up for. But how, how much is the DOE spending on security in addition to this $7.9 billion? Do you have any idea on that? I don't have that figure, no, sir. But, uh, but I assume that that's a very large figure also. Actually, out of the NNSA budget, the $8 billion, about $580 million is devoted to security. The balance is for operating the complex, uh, protecting nuclear materials in other countries like the former Soviet Union, and producing uh, naval reactor reactors that operate in our ships. So we're, we're providing uh, the, the security for, uh, for other countries as well as ours? Not, no, not or just, in that way. Or just just the Soviet Union? We are helping the former Soviet Union secure plutonium and highly enriched uranium so that uh, terrorist groups cannot get their hands on it. But providing the actual physical security or overall security at the NNSA facility is about a $580 million a year operation. What, what I'm concerned about, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is that uh, I, I remember just uh, a few weeks after the events of 9-11-2001, former Congressman Callahan, who was a senior member of the Appropriations Committee, said in a meeting that I was in that uh, he, he said, and it, it, very uh, um, sad about it, uh, I guess, uh, uh, he said th that he estimated roughly that we would spend a trillion and a half dollars over the next five years on security matters all throughout the government that we wouldn't have spent otherwise. And the Wall Street Journal uh, had an editorial after we passed the Farm Bill that we called the Farm Security Act, and they said that every department and agency was requesting, was using the threats of nine, the uh, incident of 9-11 to uh, uh, greatly increase their funding. And they said, from now on, any bill that sa has the word security in it should get four times the scrutiny. And, you know, when you think about it, if, if we go, Mr. Bednoski hit on this a, a few minutes ago when he said we have to have some sort of balance here between some reasonable security but not interfering with the overall mission of the agency. And I think that was a... a, a he may not have me meant that to be one of his key points, but I think it was because in some ways, we're going ridiculously overboard on security and wasting all kinds of money that could be being spent on many other uh, really good things. And I, uh, I just wonder, are we, are we uh, achieving the balance that we need here? Well, I don't think DOE has gone through that whole process yet. And the design basis threat was the first step to identify what is the, the threat. Well, what the more do they have to do? You well, said the there was a design basis report issued in 99. Then they spent uh, two years on a new design basis threat. I mean, are we just going to have report after report after report? What's uh, No, their next step now would be to, to look at what it will take. They've raised the bar as to what that threat is. Now they need to look at what it will take, what will be the cost versus the benefit that they will get from improvements to their systems, and there will be a certain level of risk that they will just accept that cannot be addressed. It may be too cost prohibitive, but I mean, we have identified a number of things that the agency should be looking at, including, you know, closing public access, either acquiring more lands around the facilities, closing roads, public roads that go into the facilities. Um, other things they could do is close facilities that are no longer needed. Um, 
certainly there will be the development of new facilities and the use of new technologies in some cases which may be more costly than currently in place, but there are some other things that can be done that, you know, well, are more cost efficient. Mr. Podonsky did touch on it when he said that, you know, you can, you can have so much security that you just really shut down a, a facility or you stop what's going on. And that's, I mean, it's, I know it's a very difficult question. Mr. Podonsky, do you have any comments? Well, I think you're making the point of what I was saying in my opening remarks, and that is there has to be a balance, and the Department is going through this assessment now that they have a design basis threat, they know what they are protecting against, they have the numbers, and now they have to weigh that with strategies and use of technology, and we would agree that throwing uh, or putting more money onto the sy system is not necessarily the only solution to, to meet your security uh, threats that you're trying to protect against. You know, I, I, we, we do have to take security very seriously, and I want to do that. On the other hand, I read two or three months ago an article or a column that said, you know, we have forgotten the fact that we're, you know, we're, we're wanting to protect so much against uh, terrorism that uh, and people are still 99.99% uh, likely to be killed by something else like cancer, heart disease, car wrecks, things like that, and, and here we're spending uh, trillions uh, or, or hundreds of billions on security against terrorism to the neglect of things like uh, more safety uh, on the roads and, and uh, uh, more uh, research on cancer and heart disease. And I mean, we've got to, we've got to get a hold of ourselves at some point. <laughs> well, you make a good point, and I think that supports our finding where we said that the agency has not addressed the corrective action plans appropriately. They have not done cost-benefit analyses. Right. They have not, you know, assessed the risk level. You know, they have just gone forward without, you know, really looking at what was the root cause of the problem uh, before they took corrective actions. Well, we just, not only balance is the key word, but also common sense is, is something else that we seem to be lacking in, on some of these things. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewis, and we're going to go to a, a 10 minute round of, of questions, so if you'd like to, to take them. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I know it's been asked and I know it's been responded to, but I want both of you or all any of you or the four of you to tell me why a divine, a design basic basis threat is an important document. Um, tell me why we need it. Well, basically the design basis threat sets the minimum standard to which the facilities have to be protected and it, it lays out and we're talking about all the facilities the labs the <clears throat> the environmental cleanup sites the production sites all of them the right. test site it applies to all of the department's facilities now it will apply in different ways clearly a facility that has a nuclear weapon or nuclear materials will be protected to a much higher standard than a facility that's being cleaned up and just has uh, waste materials there but it's the, it's the standard by which the facility is going to be evaluated. It's the standard to which the contractor has to operate. So it, it, it informs the, the minimum to which uh, these facilities need to be protected. Plutonium, uh, a weapons grade, enough weapons grade material of plutonium is the size of a large orange. And if it's sealed, uh, you can touch it. But it's not a, it's not a, a um, it's not all that large. Uh, highly enriched uranium, I could touch. It's the size of a large grapefruit. It weighs about 30 pounds. But neither give off any uh, noticeable signal, uh, like you know, just dirty radioactive material. And so we're not talking about a lot of, uh, we're not talking about a truckload to cause a damage. We're talking about what someone could basically carry out. We are talking about facilities that have developed weapons that um, enable us to use small amounts of this material and cause horrific um, uh, explosions. We have had testimony in this committee that terrorists could basically detonate uh, a, a nuclear uh, weapon uh, if they didn't mind going up with it. In, 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 in not all that sophisticated equipment, um, a weapon. So 
if you were to, uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of responding to Mr. Duncan, because I, I happen to agree that we could protect uh, our citizens on a whole host of different levels for a whole host of different things. Uh, and and go bankrupt and have the economy not move forward and have poverty, not have breakthroughs in medicine and so on. But when we're talking about these facilities, we're talking about potentially a uh, catastrophic uh, outcome. If terrorists get weapons-grade material, if terrorists get a weapon, or, uh, or if terrorists actually get into these sites and are able to cause some real danger. Did you, uh, uh, did either of you come to any conclusion about which sites are more vulnerable, the labs, uh, the production facilities, the um, test site, the old environmental um, uh, cleanup sites? Have, e have any of you tried to, to assess where we are most vulnerable? And if you have, uh, and, and that's not for public consumption, then we can deal with it later, but I want to know if you have assessed it. I would say we would want to discuss that this afternoon, sir. But, but this part you can say publicly. Have we assessed, do you all have a sense of what you consider most vulnerable within those four categories? I would say we have some examples okay. that we could provide. Yeah. Congressman, uh, yes. uh, we in, in, uh, for the Secretary's oversight, we do know what we believe are the more vulnerable sites and which are the more protected sites, and we'd be happy to discuss that with you in closed session, but we do have that information. Now, do each of the sites, uh, uh, can you group the production sites together and say that you have the same basic problems in, in, the, in the four, I think we have four sites? Uh, and, or the three labs, um, do we, uh, do, do, if you, if you have a problem in one lab, is it somewhat consistent with another, or are we going to have testimony uh, behind closed doors that particular sites may be more vulnerable? Uh, from our perspective, each site has its own unique characteristics. Okay. But do they have uh, similarities if they're labs versus, versus production facilities? There are similarities uh, both within the labs and also crossing over into the production sites. Okay. So there's, so you may have a problem that we have identified at a lab that may also be a shared problem at a, a production site, as you refer. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it really has to do with the materials and which facilities have which materials and how those materials might be used. Okay. So it's not a function of necessarily what the place does, but of the materials that they possess. And also, too, how the, how the facility is configured. And I, and I think it's important to recognize that this concern extends beyond NNSA, but to the department as a whole, to some of the facilities in the Office of Environmental Management. When I go through, you know, I sometimes, I'm told there are 12 sites, there are 11 sites, there are 10 sites, depending on what document I look at. And so it, it does get to be a little frustrating. It, 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 what, wh why am I given different numbers? Well, maybe I can help you out with that. It, it, in the production, the nuclear weapons complex, there are basically three design labs and four production plants and the Nevada test site. Okay. So those are the big eight as That's far as that. With their world. In the Office of Environmental Management, there's roughly about eight large cleanup sites. For the purpose of our Now, let me work, ask you, are some of those cleanup sites on any of the eight that you just mentioned? Are they eight additional sites? Uh, unfortunately, they are. The Savannah River site okay. is both a cleanup site and a weapons production site. So it's a double site. counting on my yeah. side. Okay. For the purpose of our analysis, we went to all DOE sites that have what are called Category 1 special nuclear materials, and that's basically plutonium, highly enriched uranium, that are the materials of interest. Right. that you were discussing earlier. Now, in, in those two instances, none of the cleanup sites would have those, correct? No, unfortunately they do. Uh, Hanford, uh, Rocky Flats, Idaho, and Savannah River all possess Category 1 special okay. materials. And also, too, Mr. Chairman, that not all the NNSA sites possess Category 1 materials. The ones that do have Category 1 materials, Los Alamos, Sandia, uh, Livermore, Livermore Y-12, and Pantex. The other thing that I was blown away by was that some of these facilities, they don't have 20 buildings, but if I, I, I read this when I was in the plane last night at 2.30 at night, but, but I, I think I read like 200 buildings, 300 buildings. I mean, why so many buildings at these sites? 
Well, these facilities have been built up over a long period of time. And, uh, you know, if you go to some of them, if, the first time I went, somebody said, well, think of like a 50-year-old factory, and that's what you're going to see. And that's about what a lot of these places look yeah. like. But the, the facilities that actually have, within the site, the facilities actually contain the materials of interest, that's a much smaller number, okay? And the, the materials tend to be consolidated in certain buildings and then So protected. I shouldn't be exercised by the number of buildings that you can? No, I don't think so. Uh, but Los Alamos, 43 square miles. Um, the Hanford site, 560 square miles. The Savannah River site, if I'm reading this correctly, 300 square miles. Yeah, I mean, this, the overall site is The Idaho, large. 888 square miles. Yeah, and and the issue there, and, and Mr. Bodonsky can talk about this uh, a little bit, is, you know, that provides a large area in which an adversary might be able to come closer to the site, to the actual materials, than you you would of interest to him, without potentially being detected till he was very nearby. Well, let me just ask: uh, Are the number of buildings and the the size of these facilities create uh, uh, additional problems? I, uh, obviously, the more buildings you have, that creates problems, but uh, in terms of security and so on. Uh, but but is the size of something that's a benefit? Because then we can um, have a no man's land area that, I mean. Uh, Congressman, it's a double edged sword. In some cases, from a security posture, uh, the size is, is helpful. Uh, the, the, and, and the other side is you want to start consolidating uh, uh, the target, the nuclear materials. And that's what the Department and NSA is, is starting to do. We saw an example of this actually, uh, the Department doing this uh, prior to 9-11 uh, at the Hanford site, where they consolidated their, their what we call the target to uh, just a few uh, buildings. Uh, and they continue to do that. Uh, the same thing is, going, is happening at uh, Y-12. People are looking to consolidate and, and reduce the, the exposure, if you will, to hostile elements. Okay. Um, we have some questions that the committee has written out that we need to ask, too, but uh, maybe, pardon me? Okay, we can submit them. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Thank you. I want to thank the panel. I don't have any other questions. I appreciate your participation today. We'll move on to our, our second panel, then. Our second panel will consist of Linton Brooks, the Administrator for the National Nuclear Security Administration, Department of Energy, and Joseph Mahaley, Director, Office of Security, Department of Energy. Waiting for Mr. Mahaley, who's going to be joining us. We had told him 11 o'clock, so he is not technically late. <laughs> uh, I'd like to also at this time acknowledge that uh, Mr. Tierney has uh, joined us, and um, uh, Mr. Dutch Ruppersberg had had also joined us for part Thank of the hearing. This year. Thank you, Mr. Mahaley. If both of you would please stand, we'll administer the oath. Yes. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please note for the record that the witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Mr. Brooks, Ambassador. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to here today to discuss the NNSA Safeguards and Security Program. Before I move to my remarks, I want to say that although I'm the one who's here, Secretary Abraham is deeply committed and deeply involved 
in ensuring that we have an effective safeguards and security program. I meet with him and the Deputy Secretary on these issues frequently. Uh, what I'd like to do, if I may, sir, is submit my written statement for the record and proceed with an oral statement. Um, Mr. Shays was speaking of some of the confusing aspects of the National Nuclear Security Administration, so let me clarify what my administration includes and what I'm responsible for. We are a separately organized component within the Department of, of Energy created by the Congress uh, in response to security concerns in the nuclear weapons complex. I'm responsible for the Sandia, Los Alamos, and Livermore National Laboratories, for the production plants at Y-12 in Tennessee, the Pantex plant in Texas, the Kansas City plant, which does only non-nuclear work in Kansas City, for the Nevada test site, and I'm responsible for some portions of the Savannah River uh, site where we process tritium. I'm also responsible for the Office of Transportation Safeguards, which moves all special nuclear material and all weapons. Um, I am obviously part of the Department of Energy and bound by DOE orders, uh, but the law provides that no official of the Department of Energy other than the Secretary can give me direction. And so I operate my, and the Deputy, I operate my own safeguards and security program following the policy that's developed by the Department by Mr. Mahaley. I have eight site offices at the eight facilities I just mentioned, staffed by federal employees, uh, and they're supported by a service center which is being consolidated in Albuquerque. Um, our fiscal 2004 budget request will be, is $8.8 .8 billion. There's 2,400, over 2,400 federal employees and about 55,000 contractor employees. And from that, you correctly deduce that most of what we're trying to do will, in practice, be done by non-government employees. We are, except for the Office of Transportation Safeguards, an oversight organization, primarily. We make, although we are semi-autonomous, we make effective use, very effective use, of Mr. Pananski and the Office of Independent Oversight and Performance Assurance. One of the good early decisions was not to try and have my own office like that, but to use Mr. Pananski. That gives me both the benefits of complete independence, since he doesn't work for me, and uh, substantial experience. Uh, I share Mr. Pananski's general perspective that we have made very good progress, but there's a good deal more to bring all elements of the complex to the level of effectiveness we desire. In that regard, in recent months, we've had a series of specific problems with security. In each instance, I believe we've taken immediate and aggressive action. Uh, either I or one of my top managers has been engaged directly with our site managers and with the appropriate laboratory director. Uh, I've, been, in some cases, dispatched senior teams to laboratories. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I am concerned by the pattern, although one can one can look at individual events and reach varying judgments about their security. I'm concerned by the pattern. And therefore, we will shortly uh, announce, uh, shortly means sometime in the next uh, two days, a, a series of steps to improve security. Uh, first, we will augment federal and contractor uh, security experts to make sure that we are effectively responding to some of these problems. Uh, secondly, we will direct our site managers to increase surveillance and to provide periodic reports personally to me to make sure that I understand what they're finding. Third, we've been the subject of a large number of external reviews. We think we've implemented most of the recommendations. We'll go back in a systematic way, look at every review, look at every recommendation, say, did we implement it? And if we didn't, do we want to rethink that? Uh, fourth, um, we will form, uh, fourth and fifth, we will form two groups uh, headed by senior outside uh, individuals. One to look directly at physical security and see whether there are patterns to these problems, and one to look at people. Uh, you heard in the last panel concern about staffing. I share that concern, and I particularly share the concern over the long term. I have some extremely competent people 
uh, in safeguards and security, one of whom's common characteristic is they could retire very soon. And I need to look <laughs> at what I do over the long term to make sure that 10 years from now my successor is not sitting here having to talk about uh, the same problems. Uh, retired Admiral Richard Meese will lead the panel that looks at physical security, and retired Admiral Hank Childs will lead the panel that looks at um, personnel. Uh, both of these retired four-star officers are respected professionals in the nuclear business. Both of them have commanded the U.S. Strategic Command. In addition, Admiral Childs led a congressionally mandated commission to look at weapons design personnel, and I'm looking for him to do the same thing in security personnel. Secretary and I are very pleased that they have uh, agreed to take on this uh, challenge, and we think they will help us make sure we have the optimum safety and security system for the 21st century. I'd now like to address the um, various points that you specifically asked that we cover in our testimony. First, you asked, what did we do after 9-11? Well, the most obvious things we did immediately were to execute our predetermined emergency operations plan, stop weapons shipment, deploy emergency response assets. Then my predecessor directed a short 24-hour security review and then a longer 72-hour review of potential vulnerabilities. Uh, the results are classified, but we have used them to reduce our vulnerability. For example, in the past panel, you heard comments about closing roads. We've closed roads, and we're in the process of uh, closing other roads. Uh, and then over a somewhat longer term, we assembled a team of subject matter experts to look at a whole variety of things. And once again, uh, we are implementing on a systematic basis of those recommendations. Uh, since September 11th, we've continued to strengthen our capabilities. As was mentioned in the last panel, we've increased protective forces. In the year 2000, we had 1,780 protective officers. Now we have 2,160. We've added barriers. We've closed roads. We've increased security patrols. We've increased access controls. And we've increased employee awareness. And in addition, we are, as you heard on the last panel, continuing to look at how to consolidate materials. Let me turn now to the report released this morning by the General Accounting Office on NNSA safeguards and security. Uh, first, I believe that the GAO did concentrate on the right things. I believe most things in life are a question of management, and this is clearly a question of management. If we do not get the management of safeguards and security right, we will not ever fix the problem. So. I believe the GAO was looking at the right issues. Uh, they made four broad recommendations, three of which I agree with. First, the GAO suggested formalizing roles and responsibilities. Uh, those on the panel with past experience with the Department of Energy will know that this has been a historic problem within the department. And so I agree we have to make absolutely clear to headquarters, to our field program, to contractor personnel, what the responsibilities of each are. To that end, in December of 2002, I implemented a major reorganization. That reorganization eliminates an entire layer of management, puts the site office manager as the clear, responsible, and accountable off uh, federal official at each site, makes that officer report directly to me. Uh, in addition, uh, as GAO recommended, last month we issued a specific functions, responsibilities, and authority manual for safeguards and security to clarify at sort of working level detail who does what. Uh, I think these steps address the first of GAO's recommendation, but I think that it is incumbent on me and my subordinates to be vigorous to ensure that the lack of clarity in roles and responsibilities that was one reason they created NSA doesn't recur. Uh, in particular, uh, you heard a comment from GAO about site offices uh, saying that 
that they all did things differently. A comment that's based on 18-month-old data, I would be delighted with no advance notice to have anybody call my HI office managers now and see if they believe it is still the case. I do not believe it's still the case. Secondly, the GAO suggested that we pay greater attention to contractor corrective action plans. This is one of those things that sounds mundane but is actually quite important. Uh, finding problems is appallingly easy. Fixing problems requires sustained effort. Um, while we may disagree slightly with the extent of the problem, to the extent that there are problems with contractor uh, corrective action plans, we uh, will redouble our efforts. And one of the reasons for trying to bring in additional personnel is to make sure that we are doing so. Finally, GAO expressed concern about federal staffing for safeguards and security. And I agree that effective federal oversight demands not just numbers, but quality. Uh, I have, we have reviewed with each of the site managers their allocation for safeguards and security. All believe that their current authorized staffing level is sufficient. One, however, of my site managers, although the authorized level is sufficient, has been facing severe recruiting problems. That's the Los Alamos site. The Los Alamos site has less than half of the safeguards and security professionals. Uh, I'm looking at what I can do about it. It is a, an isolated but high cost area, which means that recruiting historically has been uh, difficult there. Um, we're going to continue to monitor this, obviously, but in addition, I believe that the initiatives that I mentioned earlier um, will help us understand how to make sure that we have the adequate workforce. The one area in which I disagree with GAO uh, sounds technical, but it actually has a fairly strong policy component. The General Accounting Office recommended that we use a technique called surveys rather than a technique called surveillance in providing our oversight. Surveys involve a two-week, once-a-year on-site visit. It's very complex, very formal. There's an entry conference. There's data collection. There's out briefings. There's a report. But it only happens once a year. Under surveillance, we spread out uh, the work and do periodic surveillance throughout the year. Uh, we believe uh, that the surveillance approach is equally effective. Uh, however, uh, the GAO is correct that the current department order uh, does not support the approach that we are using. Um, current department order does not make surveillance an acceptance. Uh, an acceptable alternative. Mr. Mahaley and I have discussed that issue. We are both in agreement that the department order should be changed to legitimize the practice. The practice is right, but it is very important in safeguards and security that you're following the rules, since after all, that's what you're trying to do is make sure the rules are being followed. Uh, Mr. Mahaley will speak this afternoon and briefly today on the design basis threat. Uh, let me just say one or two words uh, about it. As you heard in the last panel, the design basis threat characterizes potential adversary threats to our facilities. Um, a question was asked about why you need it, and the answer is simple. Otherwise, you will have eight different people deciding how much of a threat to guard against and some of them will be wasting resources by overguarding, and some of them will be incurring risk by underguarding. So you need a standard. Um, we work closely with the Office of Security in developing the document that was issued last month. I believe it accurately portrays what the intelligence community is telling us uh, about the threat to nuclear weapons, material, and classified information. Uh, I have heard suggestions that the design basis threat was tailored to what we believe we can afford. Uh, as far as I know, that's completely untrue. Certainly at no time in NNSA deliberations was there any suggestion of, well, we can't accept this because we can't afford it. Uh, I don't know what the new design basis threat is going to cost. At some of my sites, I think I'm probably already there. At some of my sites, I'm going to have to spend some more money. Um, the threat 
document provides for implementation over a two-year period, as is appropriate. Uh, and I don't fully know what the cost is, but whatever it is, we're going to pay for it because it's too important not to. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, although I believe that the security posture of our complex is effective, I don't believe that we're an attractive target to those who would try to steal weapons or steal materials or steal classified material. There continue to be improvements that are required, and Secretary Abraham and I are committed to making those improvements. Since I assumed this job last July, I've been focusing personally and focused the attention of my headquarters and field officials on ensuring that our protection against theft or diversion of nuclear weapons, classified and sensitive material, is robust and effective. Uh, I don't think there's any room for failure in this program, uh, simply because the consequences of a terrorist act uh, against one of our nuclear weapons sites are almost incomprehensible. So I intend to continue uh, to work this problem vigorously. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Mahaley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity to provide the committee with information concerning the Department of Energy's recently completed efforts to update its design basis threat. DOE recently revised its design basis threat policy uh, to reflect changes in perceived threats to the United States government assets and operations. The new design basis threat policy approved in May 2003 is designed to reflect the most credible threats to departmental assets and operations and provide a baseline for operational and budgetary planning purposes. The DOE design basis threat policy is de derived from and associated with national intelligence threat information and other government agencies' threat policy statements. The 2003 DOE uh, policy is predicated on the information contained in the Defense Intelligence Agency postulated threat to U.S. nuclear weapons facilities and other selected strategic facilities dated January 2003, also uh, referred to as the Postulated Threat Statement. The Postulated Threat Statement details relevant threat information about postulated adversary team sizes, characteristics, capabilities, and applicability to national security assets. The Postulated Threat Statement is based on intelligence information detailing actual terrorist attacks and the equipment and tactics utilized in the attacks expert judgments regarding stated terrorist intentions and their, their ability uh, to execute the stated objectives and postulated capabilities based on uh, the latest knowledge concerning terrorist activities. Prior to September 11th, uh, prior to those attacks in New York and Washington, the Department of Energy in August 2001 requested that the intelligence community prepare an update to the 1994 postulated threat statement. Although the 94 postulated threat statement was designed to be a 10-year document, we believed at that time that changes in international politics, emerging technologies, and increases in worldwide terrorism required a reassessment. The National Intelligence Co Coordinating Committee assigned the primary responsibility for updating the postulated threat statement to the Defense Intelligence Agency. The events of September 11th delayed the postulated threat statement update effort due to reallocation of critical assets. However, the requested postulated threat statement update was fully underway by January 2002. The primary entities collaborating on the revision to the postulated threat statement were the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of the Navy, Department of the Army, Department of the Air Force, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy's Office of Security, which I direct, began revising the DOE design basis threat policy in October 2001. Our work on the revised DOE design basis threat policy was carried out in parallel with the work on the updated postulated threat statement to reduce the amount of time that would be required to issue a final DOE design basis threat upon completion of the postulated threat statement. After the release of the postulated threat statement in January of this year, we made final revisions to the departmental design basis threat policy, and the policy was then coordinated with uh, the Department of Energy, including, as Litton Brooks has just uh, pointed out the National Nuclear Security Administration, and that revised policy was approved by uh, Deputy Secretary of uh, Energy Kyle McSlero on May 20th. The new design basis threat policy will provide managers an improved threat policy document to plan, resource, and execute vital safeguards and security programs. In addition to updated threat information, the revi revised uh, policy includes a significant enhancement over prior policies. We call it the use of a graded threat concept. The graded threat concept considers and accounts for factors such as the consequences of a malevolent event, 
the attractiveness of the assets sought by the terrorists, the ability of an adversary to accomplish a given objective with an asset, and the resources required by an adversary to accomplish a given objective. The graded threat approach includes the establishment of threat levels for departmental facilities and associated protection strategies based on the assets located at a given facility. The DBT, or Design Basis Threat Policy, separates uh, the threat levels into two distinct categories. One category of threat levels covers theft, disruption of mission, espionage, and foreign intelligence collection. And the second category of sabotage threat levels covers radiological, chemical, and biological sabotage. Five threat levels are established for theft, disruption of mission, and espionage and foreign intelligence. Threat level one, which is the highest, are, uh, are uh, used to describe <coughs> facilities that receive, use, process, store, transport, or test what we call Category 1A assets. Those are nuclear weapons, nuclear test devices, or completed nuclear assemblies. Threat levels run through Threat Level 5, which is the lowest, for facilities that are only required to maintain minimum safeguards, accountability, or security operations. That is, an example would be a small office activity, a tenant in a larger office building, or a small isolated research or test facility. Uh, facilities that don't possess quantities of special nuclear material. Four sabotage threat levels are established for radiological, chemical, and biological sabotage. Sabotage threat level one, that's the highest level, through level four, the lowest, are set for those facilities, buildings, or operations that process, store, or transport radiological, chemical, and biological materials by the degree to which these materials, if dispersed, would result in acute dose effects at the site boundary. Immediately following the events of September 11th, the departmental the department in implemented measures to augment safeguard and security for the most critical departmental assets. Um, Ambassador Brooks described what happened in the NNSA. That was pretty much mirrored throughout the rest of the department. Even our NNSA activities are sometimes involved in transporting nuclear material. Um, those shipments were suspended. Uh, we went to our highest possible security condition. Uh, absent, uh, we went to CCON 2 is what we call it. Uh, CCON 1 is reserved for a situation where an actual attack is, is directed at a DOE facility. We went to our highest security level, suspended shipments, and that was pretty much uniform throughout the department. The revised design basis threat policy is effective immediately, will be implemented over the next several years. Actions to augment existing safeguard and security programs for those facilities and assets that are considered the highest security policy, uh, the highest security priority will be undertaken as soon as practicable. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my uh, prepared testimony. Thanks for the opportunity to appear before the committee, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Mahaley. Uh, we want to recognize that uh, Mr. Todd Platts from Pennsylvania has joined us for the hearing, and uh, welcome. And also, uh, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the hearing record at this point a statement from Senator Charles Grassley of Iowa. Senator Grassley is a co-requester with the Subcommittee on Related GAO Work that will be the subject of a future hearing. Um, Mr. Ambassador, I, I appreciate your comments and the confidence in which you describe the actions that you're taking. I mean, this is obviously, uh, when you start hearing some of the testimony about procedures and processes, it certainly loses some of the excitement that I think we all would expect in the um, severity of the issue that we're dealing with, which is the security of our nuclear facilities and, and really the, the catastrophic um, consequences if you don't succeed. Um, we've had um, a testimony from the General Accounting Office, um, and we know that, that uh, even the NNSA uh, has indicated uh, that, they're cons that you are concerned that um, at times uh, that managing the safeguards and the security programs have not been uh, fully effective, and that concerns as to um, uh, the security of the complex. Um, in, in listening, Ambassador, to the actions that you're taking, um, I, the um, Clearly, you've acknowledged some problems that have occurred in the past that you've not been, been fully satisfied. Um, I'm assuming that, that you're not fully satisfied still as to where you are as a result of, of, of your, um, your actions. But I guess the, the big question that, that I um, have is, you know, what do you need? In addition to the authority that you have and in the actions that you're taking, uh, what do you see as you survey uh, what um, the problem is in, in front of you? Uh, that you currently don't have, either in authority or resources? Um, I, I, wrote this down. I, wrote I believe down. that I largely have the authority and the resources I need. There are specific 
once again, lower level issues. For example, uh, we have asked the Congress um, to change the law to allow investigations <coughs> of some of our people to be conducted by the Office of Personnel Management rather than the FBI. Um, if you look, we are not able to discern any difference in the quality of those investigations, but, but we have to have them done before we can give them the appropriate clearance to be in sensitive facilities, and that includes guard force. What we are able to discern is that the wait time for the FBI is sort of in the mid-200 days, and the wait time for OPM investigations is in 180 days. So we have asked the Congress to give the Secretary the flexibility to direct more of our investigations there. Now, this sounds like a very technical point, but it's not. It's not because um, the first line of defense are, is the Guard Force, but you can only use guards who are appropriately cleared, and nobody wants to change that. And so as you try to expand your Guard Force, you, it is important to be able to move rapidly to get them cleared. It's particularly true since uh, one of the problems that we are working on is that our guard forces generally are doing a lot of overtime. Now, if you talk privately to guards, they tend to like overtime, at least some of it, because they actually base their standard of living on the assumption that they're going to get some overtime. But we're doing more of it than we'd like to do. One example, one problem, for example, has been each time the nation goes to Homeland Security Orange, Mr. Mahaley and I tell the Secretary he should go to CECON too, and he does, and what that does is put more guards around things. And since there aren't any more guards, what it means is people work longer uh, hours. So anything I can do to speed up the process of uh, bringing on new guards at these plants is a useful thing. But that's not a very profound thing. Uh, it, it's, it, it's illustrative in my view of the fact that security is a whole lot of individually not very glamorous things carried out day in and, and day out. But I'm not, I'm not here saying, oh, if only the Congress would give me more money. I, I could certainly think of things to do with more money. This is not primarily a money problem. This is a roles, responsibilities, oversight, culture problem that we're trying to solve right now. Um, I, I take it, though, that, that you do remain con concerned as to the performance level. Um, the, you know, um, the, the initial question of your level of satisfaction, you're, you're saying that you have the authority and the resources, which is a great the buck stops here uh, answer. Um, and, and I I wanted to get a sense from you that, that you do have some concern and, and that I this is not having some. it happening in a timely manner and that it is not happening as effectively as it should. Sir, I mean, we're dealing with nuclear weapons. You've got to be concerned at anything less than perfection. Uh, so, of course, I'm concerned. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that we are moving in the right direction. I think that the as you heard from Mr. Podonsky, there have been some substantial uh, improvements. Uh, I think that where I have, for example, cultural problems, cultures don't change overnight. All right? I, if you have problems of being lax in enforcing rules, if you have problems of not being prompt in reporting problems, those are cultural problems and training problems, and you change them um, but it takes time. So I, I don't want to mislead the committee. Uh, I think I'm in the right direction. I think I'm seized with the problem. But I don't think if you invite me back in two weeks, I'm going to be able to walk in and say, look at the wonderful things we've done in the last two weeks. I don't think that's the way this problem works. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Haley, thank you for joining us. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I think you were correct in saying that most of these things go back to management. And I know the Secretary uh, had made a statement that he was going to take the University of California and uh, the contract and put it up for review and it expires in 2005. Uh, are you mindful that that's the correct way to proceed? And uh, if you are, 
should something be done between now and 2005 to enhance the job that we think they're doing? Um, he, well, since the Secretary made that decision based on a recommendation from the Deputy Secretary and me, I, I certainly okay, support it. Um, we are doing things, uh, not so much pointed at 2005, because we're doing things to continue to improve. The problems at Los Alamos that led to that decision did not spill over into security. They were primarily in business services. Uh, although you've recently seen one example that may spill over into security, um, there was what appears to have been a bookkeeping problem associated with a very small amount of plutonium. Best I can tell, that problem, which happened two years ago but was only recently discovered, is another example of a general lax approach to business processes and the first one that actually spills over and has security things. One of the reasons that we were so concerned was the fear that um, poor discipline and processes in one area sooner or later spread. So while I don't mean to minimize the importance of control of material um, and wise stewardship of the public money, you, you want to stomp out the problems in that area before they get to things like classified material control or, or physical uh, security. What is being done at Los Alamos is a uh, new laboratory director who was put in with our approval by the university following uh, the problems is doing a major top to bottom overhaul of his business uh, processes. So I don't think there's anything that needs to be done between now and 2005 that isn't being done. Well, the oversight issue, uh, either you gentlemen or both of you might want to respond to this. The assertion is made that uh, some of the reviews of the test of the performance of the security were being dumbed down. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, give us um, some assurances? I, that I think you and Mr. Pananski on the previous panel said that uh, he believes that that is uh, an accurate description of the way it was in the 90s. And he doesn't believe it's an accurate description of the way it is now. Are you uh, comfortable that it's not? I, I am comfortable with that. Okay. The uh, fact of the matter is, is that terrorists now appear ready to give up their own lives in order to accomplish their purpose. So uh, it becomes pretty important for us to not just worry about containing them once they get to a site, but keeping them out of that site. Is, are you mindful of the fact, or do you uh, feel confident of the fact that all NNSA facilities are able to do that at this time? Yes. And what do you base that on? Base that on a series of uh, reviews by Mr. Podonsky, a series of reviews by me, and then an approach that my predecessor uh, started called um, iterative site analyses, which is another way of, uh, of uh, looking at these. Design basis threat that Mr. Mahaley was talking about is the standard against which we try and make that assessment. I don't yet know uh, whether or not I can make that statement about the May 30th design basis threat or what I have to do to be able to make that statement. I, I don't want to get into details in an open session. At most of my sites, I'm pretty comfortable that I was ahead of the new design basis threat at one or two, there may be some things we're going to need uh, to do, and we're still looking at that. Well, I'm going to let you go with that because my next question, I think, will take us into the closed session this afternoon about what level of comfort Americans should have generally about all of these sites. Uh, but given the fact that the design basis threat is just evolving and, and you've got to make some assessments on that, I'll yield back to balance my time. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. Chairman Chase. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brooks. Uh, uh, I found uh, both your testimonies helpful, uh, uh, but I was particularly interested in your testimony, uh, given that it, uh, your oral testimony had uh, an action plan that was not part of your written testimony. Um, I inquired if maybe that was written down and it wasn't. Uh, could you go through your action plan that you... Sure. I uh, actually had hoped to be able to hand you a press release today. I actually think I'll now be able to hand you a press release tomorrow okay. because of a teeny tiny internal... It's not, it's not a problem. criticism. I'm, I'm delighted but, to... But to... what I'm doing first, we are going to augment 
drawing from a number of things. I'm going to make some use of some of Mr. Haley's people. I'm going to make some use of some contractor people. I'm going to make some use of other people. I'm going to at least temporarily beef up the number of people that I have working on this issue. Secondly, I'm going to use those beefed up people uh, and use my sites to um, be more vigorous on safety and secure, uh, safeguards and security, but also to be reporting more directly to me. Uh, and frankly, that's symbolic. I don't want to pretend that I know as much about safeguards and security as the superb people I have working for me or the superb people Mr. Mahaley has working for me. But it is my experience that when you have to report to the senior person, then there can be no question that this is something that you take seriously. Third, um, we have been the subject of um, a number of external reviews, most of them critical. Um, by we here, I mean the whole department as well as the NNSA uh, over the past several years. We're in the process of systematically going through all of those, looking at their recommendations, seeing whether we implemented them, and then if we didn't, looking again to see whether or not uh, we should. I don't want I don't want to have a situation in which people thought that a problem was going to be solved without X or Y. And fourth, I'm asking Admiral Rich Meese to look specifically at um, physical security throughout my complex, and I am going to, while not limiting him, I'm going to ask him to be very specific about one or two ideas that periodically float around about better management. And finally, um, as we have in the last uh, month or two been looking at this problem, I have become concerned about people. Um, I, I'm not sure I completely agree with the GAO that I'm short now, but I'm real sure that if I don't take aggressive action now, I will be short in terms of quality and experience in the future. The last time we had that problem was on weapons designers, and we got Admiral Childs to run a commission to look at how we in, uh, ensured that we had a stable core of weapons designers. I'm asking him to do the same thing for safeguards and security uh, professionals. So that's the five things I'm doing. I know I'm being redundant, but um, well, before I'm redundant, let me ask another question. The, um, you said you agreed with all but one of the four major yes, sir. categories. Uh, and the one, you defining clear roles and responsibilities, there was assessment site security activities. That's the one you disagreed with. The, the, method, the method of surveillance versus surveys is the method. Yep. I think it's actually their second or third. I can't remember. I, put it there. I, I don't have the, let me just look at the. Well, the other one, overseeing contra contractors, corrective that. actions, and the others allocating staff. But the thing that I thought was interesting, though, was you seem to disagree with defining clear roles and responsibilities. Cause oh, no, sir, I didn't mean to say that. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. The defining clear roles and responsibilities is the precursor to everything. Right. I, what I, I think you jumped in too quick. You, you may want to let me finish I'm before sorry. you. Uh, no, I, I was I was very impressed with your testimony, and I was encouraged by it. But I was, you, you said you would challenge anyone to check with people along the chain about their not knowing what their roles and responsibilities were, and so on. I think that's what you said, and that seemed to be suggesting that you were disagreeing uh, with um, the GAO's findings that there wasn't this. <coughs> So I, I must have missed something here that I... I wasn't precise. May I try again, sir? Sure. Um, the GAO conducted their audit over a very lengthy period of time. Okay. Many of their interviews with individual sites were conducted 18 months ago. Right. In their, in response to a question, I think, from you, the GAO used the illustration that when they went to individual sites, they said, we don't quite know who's supposed to do what, so we're deciding on our own. I believe that part of the problem I have corrected with the reorganization announced in December and the promulgation of formal roles and responsibilities. I agree completely with the GAO's 
assessment that the problem is important. I believe I have done a great deal to correct it, and I'm going to continue to push that. That's what I was trying to okay. convey, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rupertsberger. I'm glad the issue has been raised about it starts at the top in management. And, uh, and again, I was impressed with where, where you're going. Uh, now, the one thing is to have a plan. The other thing is to implement a plan. Number one, how is your relationship and working relationship with the intelligence agencies, uh, CIA, FBI, whatever, as it relates to, to the security of, of the plants? I mean, are you working closely with them? Could you just what you can say in this open hearing, where are you with respect to that relationship? Because it seems to me one of the, one of the, one of the, the number one component to, to deal with the issue of terrorism is, is the issue of intelligence. The um, Department of Energy's Office of Intelligence reports to the Secretary, but I am, if not their largest customer, certainly their most eager customer. I am briefed by the intelligence agencies uh, daily. Um, I look at specific details of threats daily. Um, as you know from the open source accounts, you know, there are, there's a lot of chaff in that wheat, but we look uh, carefully daily. When I see something that I believe uh, requires us to pay attention, I make sure that it gets to my site managers and my contractors. My sites also have field intelligence elements. They focus in two directions. One is the National Labs actually is where a good deal of our technical intelligence on nuclear weapons is done. Uh, but secondly, they provide another uh, mechanism for uh, disseminating things. There's probably no area in which I am more comfortable than that I'm fully plugged into the intelligence community and getting what I need. The problem, of course, as 9-11 taught us, is that we cannot depend solely on the hope that the intelligence community will discover problems. But I know what the intelligence community knows. I'm fully comfortable. I suspect that's true for Mr. Mahaley also, but he should speak for him on that. Sir, um I've seen a big change since 9-11. Uh, <coughs> DOE's Office of Intelligence has been, in the past, I've been there a while. I've been, the, this is my seventh year as head of security, and the Office of Intelligence was traditionally directed at non-proliferation, looking at um, information collected around the world and uh, advising, sort of being the government's lead uh, analysis center on that intelligence as it regards non-proliferation nuclear weapons development. Since 9-11, um, the Office of Intelligence has um, focused, and, and it was at my request in terms of I wanted um, a counterterrorism focus to try to pull together the information for all the agencies because, you know, we can beat these people. It's just we've got to talk to each other and share the information. So um, the new director of intelligence has elevated the counterterrorism uh, section to a division and the director um, of that division reports to me at least once a week with a detailed analysis of everything he's covered in the previous week. Some days I get briefed two or three times a day. Well, that's good. And the teamwork, I think if you look at what has happened since 9-11, the teamwork with all of our agencies, which in the past hasn't been as good, has really helped deter another incident. Absolutely. Let me get to the issue of, of uh, your security now. Uh, with respect to your contractors, uh, you have a uh, large amount of contractors that, that deal with your security. Uh, you, do you feel secure that your oversight of these contractors, that they are doing the job, that they're assessing themselves? I mean, are there any checks and balances there to make sure that, that the, there's consistency? Because you have different sites throughout the country. And my concern would be is, is and, and another issue, you have three you have, you have three different components, I guess, in your operation. Is that too much bureaucracy? Or would you feel more comfortable, probably not, uh, to federalize as it relates to this entire uh, issue uh, instead of the, the, the contractors that we have right now? Um, let me, uh, first, the re one reason that I'm comfortable that I know across the organization 
is the ability to use Mr. Podonsky's organization, the Office of, of Oversight and Independent Assessment. Uh, they look at all the sites and therefore they are able, both in a formal and what's even more important, in an informal way, to tell me whether there is consistency uh, in approach. Um, we also, an example is Secretary and I have asked him to look at protective forces throughout the complex because we've had problems now uh, at two of our sites in which individual protective force officers found problems and they weren't promptly reported. We're trying to understand whether those are unique problems or broad problems and so we're going to look at um, protective forces throughout the sites. With regard to federalization of security, uh, the problem there is, um, I think, manpower and whether or not you are likely to be able to come up with a sufficient federal force and have the flexibility. I, I don't, it's one of the things I want these two groups I've charted to look at, but my biases are that the problems that we are having are not because the force is not federalized. Now, there is one component that is. The Office of Transportation Safeguards, the people who actually move plutonium from here to there or weapons from here to there, that's an entirely, uh, those are all federal agents. Uh, as far as federalizing the entire contractor uh, force, I think country made a decision a long time ago that, that the national labs in particular, uh, but the plants too, um, weren't the sort of thing that the federal government ought to be directly uh, operating. And I, I, I tend to agree with that. We can, I can go into more detail if, if you need. But I, I certainly would not think that federal control of the internal workings of the labs and plants will make anything better. Federal control of security is an idea that comes up and needs to be taken seriously. I don't, I personally think it'll just change the problem. I don't think it'll improve it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Potts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize, I need to run off, but I do appreciate your testimonies and the written uh, testimonies you provided. Just uh, one question before I go is the, um, appreciating the focus on the, on the management and the defined roles and increased security staff numbers. Um, but one of the things that, that jumps out to me in the GAO report is that um, in, in relation to the new design basis threat, that the GAO estimates that it'll probably be the 2006 fiscal year before we really get a full picture of what the cost of, of the changes are gonna be required in relation to meeting this new design basis threat and, and anywhere from two to five years till we fully implement and, and have these uh, new procedures in place and, and really doing what we want them to do. Um, my, my question is, is do you agree with this general time frame uh, that the GAO uh, predicts and if so, uh, what is the greatest reason for that time, you know, that delay, given the seriousness of the threats we're talking about? Um, you know, we're, this is saying really uh, anywhere from uh, maybe another six to eight years. And you referenced in your opening statement about not wanting a successor to be sitting here in 10 years having to answer similar questions. Um, my worry is that you know, six to eight years from now, the, the th the threat again will be different and we'll be always playing catch up. So uh, do you agree with it? And, and why is it gonna take so long to, to get implemented? What's the greatest challenge in getting this done? I, I agree that we're gonna phase things in. I think the timelines that, that you cite are probably wrong. I expect to know what this is gonna cost um, by, the, by early fall so that we can adjust the fiscal year 05 budget, uh, which is the next one we get to prepare uh, as necessary. The threat, w the design basis threat document, and, and I'll let Mr. Mahaley comment further if he would, is in fact, um, it, if you have something that you can meet in a day and a half, you haven't looked rigorously enough. We, we have looked, Mr. Mahaley in particular has looked at the changes that we have to think about because of the 
the change realization of the degree of organization that terrorists might have. And so we're basically taking a step to improve, and that takes time. I, I, I'm not quite sure where six to eight years comes from, but I'd be th – that's certainly not my understanding of my guidance from the Secretary, and I, I don't believe if, that's what the promulgation for the new document says. If, if, um, if you have a good handle on, uh, on these, the costs associated with the, the changes necessary by this fall, you're in to the beginning of the 04, although we may not – depending on how fast the appropriations bill, we may not yet have an 04 appropriations done. Um, is, is there uh, consideration being given at this point to uh, coming forward with a supplemental request because of the seriousness of the issue we're talking about and that uh, rather than waiting for the 05 budget to get it in there and have it go through the process, that we look at 04 and saying, hey, we here's what we now know we need. We, can't, we don't want to wait a year because of the, the threat that we're talking about. Um, is that something under I, consideration? I, I think it's premature to know the answer to that. Um, I mean, my initial impression is that I'm not talking at, on my side of the House. I can't speak for the rest of the Department. That I'm not talking at most of my sites about significant uh, funding, and that I that a supplemental would not be appropriate. Um, the decision to submit supplementals is not one that Mr. Mahaley and I get to make. Uh, I will simply say that if but recommendations as if, to if I believe that I have a problem, the secretary has made it fairly clear he wants to hear about it. But at the moment, I don't know. I I, I do not anticipate that I will see problems that cannot be dealt with through reallocation in 04, but if I do, I'll talk to the Secretary and he'll talk within the administration and we'll do what's right, because this is very important to us. Well, and that, that's my focus, is that we don't allow a, a you know, a paper a bureaucratic time frame for submitting a budget request, having it go through the process, be approved, if it's, you know, a serious uh, national security issue uh, that we uh, look at doing whatever we need to do immediately, um, not when the next budget comes comes forward. So I appreciate, again, your testimonies and, and your efforts, uh, respectively, in your offices. Can Thank I add something, Mr. Platt? Yeah. <laughs> One thing I notice a lot of concern here about the timing. People should appreciate, and we'll probably get, get into this in more detail this afternoon, that when you issue a new threat policy, it's essentially a requirements driver. You're going to have to it's, it's analogous in a very rough way to the Pentagon saying we're going to plan to fight 2.4 wars or something, and then the Navy and the Air Force go out and resource to meet that requirement. We've raised a new requirement, okay, mm -hmm. for our department. We have superb security police officers deployed throughout the complex, okay, probably not enough of them because of the overtime requirements and everything else, but you just don't snap your fingers and hire those people and do it. It takes a year and I'm not talking about the security clearances, to get these people on board, train them. We have a minimum 320-hour basic training for our security police officers before they get the site-specific training, and that's just at the basic level. When you get up to our, what we would call the SRT or SWAT qualified officers, these are superb professionals, and it takes time to build that force. The other point I want to make is that no responsible manager out there should just throw troops at this. Okay, they're going to have to take a look and say, I have SNM in that facility. Does it really need to be there? Do I need all these points of access and egress in this facility? How is this facility designed? Is this facility old? Are we going to replace it in two or three years? Build that into the design. Um, there, there are so many factors. That's they're all valid. Building. That's a responsible, I think, <coughs> period to, to bring this in. And, and certainly all valid points, but uh, the fact that we're, we're approaching the two years since September 11th now, yes, sir. and now we're just saying, all right, now we have a new design basis threat. But, and but, but please, sir, don't believe we've been sitting around since right. September 11th. No, no. Uh, I, I, I think both of us I, tried I, to make clear. We, I, I don't believe you are, but we still are almost two years since September 11th, and, and that's my point is, is, is – uh, every day that passes, um, there's a, a terrorist individual or group out there that's looking for weaknesses, yes, and, and I, I certainly commend your efforts. I, I know you take them seriously and your responsibilities and, and uh, are doing We just finalized an effort. We did issue interim guidance throughout this period. 
our people out in the field have been anticipating this. Great. I, I know my time's well expired, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Butts. We'll go then to a second round of questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, right now, the law requires surveys or the regulations or policy. Um, I'm hearing you, Ambassador Brooks, say you want surveillance. Correct. That we're doing surveillance without the policy saying we are. That's kind of what I'm hearing. So I'm a little confused by that. Mr. Malley, maybe you can tell me how that happens and whether it should. Well, That's not a fair question to ask him, sir, because <laughs> he's prohibited by law from telling me what to do. I did it. I, my... Why don't, why don't we have him tell me that? I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, yeah, he's... A, he, um, he, <laughs> You're, you have a good nature. A you want to protect sir. everyone. I mean, essentially, but. what has happened is some people will think they have a good idea in the NSA. They've gotten ahead of their headlights. Okay? Our, our policies written in DOE safeguard and security orders call for surveys. A survey is essentially a very comprehensive checkoff list done by the federal manager. Okay? Surveillance is, is not this once a year checkoff list. It's a continual monitoring process, if, I'm, if that's fair to say. That's just not contemplated by our policy right now. I don't have but, any, but, but any problems with it in, in, uh, in theory, but we don't have detailed guidelines for our field offices to use right now. And that's what Linton's talking about in terms of us having okay. to develop, develop, develop the policy. Right, but, but intuitively it seems to me to make sense that you would do that. So, But Ambassador Brooks, you wanted to say? Oh, I simply want him to make it clear that if you disagree with what I'm doing, it, it's not Joe Mahaley's fault. Because, <laughs> right. um, no, I think what we have here, we've been trying very hard to, to move the NNSA in the directions we think it needs to go. And we have occasionally um, pushed a little bit ahead of the paperwork, and I'm trying to fix that and get, for okay. example, um, I made it clear to the site managers what they were responsible for last fall, but we didn't get this formal manual out clarifying that until last month. So we're trying, we're, we're, we are trying to push to improve things as fast as we can while still documenting the magnitude. Okay. So the bottom line is you think it's a good idea. You started to act on it, Mr. Mahaley. Uh, uh, you would describe it as getting in front of the headlights. I don't know if uh, if I would describe it that way, um, but it's you know I'll think about it. Um, I don't quite understand force on force exercises. I'm I was looking at a picture in the jail report of a helicopter. I'm assuming this is, you know, the bad guys landing uh, over the line. But uh, what I don't understand is how you can do them and 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 how they work. Um, we, you, you would want to tell someone that when five helicopters fly into your site, you don't want to knock them out of the sky uh, because they happen to be your people just testing the, the, the concept. Uh, so I, I, I'm asking you a question about the value of force on force exercise. How does it work and how do you both respond to it? Um, I actually believe that's a picture of one of our security helicopters at Savannah River site deploying a special response team. Okay. Um, so they're on our side. I have a, a, a much greater imagination. I, I saw them with masks on. Um, but at any rate, yes, sir. let's um, just say that uh, helicopters are flying. In. I don't understand how an exercise works. If you tell people you're going to do it, they're prepared for it. So the parameters, they're prepared for it. But, um, but you just tell them a second before or five minutes before? No, sir, you set it up. You have to set up safety briefs. Uh, uh, you have to uh, make you, sure that you tell the both sides are established. Yeah. Yes, sir. Within and there's parameters in terms of um, uh, when they can attack, uh, what their target is. These are operational sites, so when you do force on force, they have to be carefully uh, planned and executed, and evaluated. Okay. Um, so, so what I'm gathering is a force on force exercise doesn't indicate whether or not you can defend them. Uh, they are just really a practice that enables them to go through the process. In other words, you're warning them. I, let me say it this way. It would be wrong, would it be wrong for me to interpret that a force on force exercise will determine the capability to protect the site? Or are they really nothing more than an exercise? No, I, I think the, uh, your former uh, summary is, is probably more correct. And let me explain the process. I'm forgetting which was my former summary, but... That, that they do have a bearing in determining whether or not the site is satisfactorily okay. protected. 
Um, they're they're uh, see I, I they're I, part of a process that we go through. Uh, let's just look at it this way: we issued a design basis threat. You really can't get down to brass tacks until you apply that design basis threat to a given site. All right. Once you apply that design basis threat, this requirement that the secretary has set for the site, they then have to analyze how they're how they're going to implement that, and that involves vulnerability assessments of the site, and the goal is going to be to develop a site safeguard and security plan. In the course of vulnerability assessments, the, and, and all the models and simulation and uh, the other tools we use, there are going to be hard points that surface. In other words, in some situations, your, your security forces are going to prevail. It's going to be clear. There's not going to be any question. <coughs> the areas you want to test on force on force are those areas where it's close. And you want to see how your actual forces perform and see if your assumptions about their reaction times and their capabilities are borne out in actual testing. Now, I would never want to suggest, and I think anybody who's ever seen one or planned one or participated in one would never suggest that there aren't artificialities, that you know they don't necessarily represent uh, what's going to happen, but it's a, it's a very effective tool uh, that we use to, to basically look at the, the finer points of that, that site yeah, safeguard and security plan. I have a red light here, but I, I, realize, I realize it's a finer tool. I, I mean, I realize it's a tool to be used. I guess I'm just trying to determine how much we should, on the outside, assess, or you on the inside should assess uh, your capability to defend if, in fact, you, you had to warn people, prepare them, um, it, there's not an element of surprise. Do you ever do the following? Do you ever, um, all of us s announce that in the next month there will be a, 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 an attempt to breach the facility and that you will be given a five-minute warning and go from there and do that? No. Okay. You know, that's a good way to get people killed, Mr. Chairman. I okay. mean, these, these, and, are, and, these are and, guards and, and, who are authorized to use deadly force and armed very well, very well trained. And, and, you, and that's just my okay, personal opinion. Fine. No, I'm, I don't think that's, that's the right way to go. I, I, I don't, a nuclear I, weapons facility. I don't want to get people killed. Right, sir. But I don't want to then uh, say that when you have an attempt, when everybody has been briefed thoroughly about it, that it is going to describe to us how easily or, or well we'll be able to defend a facility, because it does have clear limits. Well, it, it answers questions, sir. And, and I think you have to kind of take a whole series of these force-on-force -force exercises in toto. You know what I'm confused about? I'm confused why you'd be disagreeing with me. I mean, not because I'm up here and you're there. It would seem to me the answer would be yes. It has its limits. Uh, it, it won't be able to, I mean, Fair tell enough. me if you disagree with this. I mean, it, it is a wonderful practice. You're going to see where you have weaknesses, but it isn't going to be able to give us an assessment that we can protect a facility. Uh, 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 in, in the way that we might think we can. It, it's not going to provide all the answers, I guess. That's absolutely correct, okay. sir. Okay. Absolutely correct. Yeah. But it is an exercise that is helpful. I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Tierney. I have no questions. I'm going to time. Mr. Rupertsberg? Yeah, just uh, getting back to the, the uh, oversight of the contractors. And, you know, uh, the, there is a problem sometimes with inconsistency. Uh, one of my concerns, you have different levels, level one, level two. And, uh, and could you describe that, please, as far as the, the type of facility? And yet, any, any nuclear um, components getting in the hands of terrorists, wherever they may be, will make a difference. And is there, is there a, a, a procedure in place to identify all a consistent security procedure for both of your, your, your levels uh, of uh, plants or operations or sites? Uh, I don't want to get into specifics, or I'd like to hold that for the closed session this afternoon. Okay, that's fine. Let's get this another issue then. Uh, in order to be able, in management, it starts at the top. Yes, but sir. I think good managers listen to the front line. Um, it ha has there been an assessment from people who are working on the front line that might not be, be uh, have the access to, to upper-level management, uh, a plan to, to uh, make a survey, ask questions on what they feel needs to be done as it relates to security? It's, it's kind of funny you ask that, sir. We, um, uh, my predecessor, General Gene Habiger, who was the uh, security czar in the last administration, tried to do a survey, and uh, we ran afoul of the Paperwork Reduction Act and the need to get, you know, we've got this funny relationship where we're a federal agency with 
14,000 feds and 130,000 contractors, and uh, we were not able to do that security survey. But we do, we do get feedback. I get feedback. I just went out to Albuquerque for our national competition. I met with all the site safeguard and security directors. I met with uh, probably about 200 officers. Um, I met the uh, feds and the contractors, and we encourage that sort of feedback. And by the way, it was a classified session with, with those site safeguard and security managers and contractors, and we discussed the uh, design basis threat been many, implementation. Have of whistleblower uh, cases where front frontline individuals are trying to get information out that they've? I'm sure they, there are. Yeah. And, and the but then, then the issue there for management them. it needs to be, in my opinion, the front line needs to be heard, to be analyzed, to make sure that we, in, when you're dealing with this type of security, and it's so important that we, that we, part of the analysis of your security must be dealing with, with that front line. There is a, I'm concerned with that. Um, we, uh, we also try in informal ways to sample. Um, we, uh, we, for example, um, I had some people out looking at an investigation, but just as they were walking, they would talk to protective force officers, get their ideas. I meet with the working level of my site offices when I travel. So we try and get that feedback. With respect to whistleblowers, and I, I want to be very careful here. Um, I don't want to suggest that I am discouraging anybody from communicating with the Congress or the Office of Special Counsel um, or within the limits of security, the press. I am bothered whenever I see somebody who is apparently sincere in wanting to fix things and believes he or she has to go outside the system to do it. I, there, there is a cultural, I mentioned earlier that there are cultural issues. There's a cultural problem at some of my facilities. It's not retaliation, it's not even disinterest in the subject, it's Oh, I'm busy. Don't bother me. I don't know what it is, but I'm trying to work I'm not on that. Going, I'm not trying to go there with respect to the issues of whistleblowers. I'm looking at the total assessment. When you have, uh, when you have partnerships between business and government, and, and you're dealing with national security, there needs to be an assessment of what's happening. And a lot of times, we up top, uh, at the highest level, don't get the information. And sometimes the front line gets it. I'm just, I'm just want to make sure, or that's why I'm asking the questions, the consistency of their security programs, consistency between a level one and level two. Let me, let me get into another level. Uh, we talk about physical secu uh, security. How about the uh, computer networks? I mean, which is an important part also. Where are we with respect to that? I think, um, I refer you to Mr. Podonsky's prepared statement, and what he will tell you is we're in good shape on the classified networks, that we are, uh, we, we don't have any, I mean, Cybersecurity is an infinite ladder. You can always make it better. But we don't have significant problems on the classified networks. On the unclassified networks, um, there are some problems that have been identified that we're trying to, uh, to work on. And those problems are whether or not we are strong enough, not just at the external hacker sitting in a basement somewhere, but, for example, at one of our facilities where we have, because these are scientific laboratories, have foreign nationals, whether we are segmenting the unclassified network as thoroughly as we, as we might. We've had another problem recently in which um, uh, someone was obtaining salary data uh, on an unclassified network. You're not supposed to be able to do that. So. I don't think that it is serious in terms of national security, because by definition, unclassified information is unclassified. In terms of sound management, um, we've got a way to go on the unclassified side on cybersecurity, at, at least at my sites. Okay. Well, gentlemen, I, I want to thank you for your testimony here today and certainly for your efforts. Um, as you are aware and as has been said earlier in the hearing, we're having a closed session this afternoon so that we can have a, a greater discussion of issues uh, surrounding this that are classified. And in, in recognition that we have the, uh, the closed session, uh, I wondered if you, e either of you had anything else you wanted to add to the record in this public session.
No, sir. Okay. No, thank sir, you very thank much. You. Uh, thank if you. I could, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, what we'd like you to think about, uh, you have the prerogative to testify separately in the, when we uh, go in the closed session. We might be able to cover the issue uh, if we do it in a larger panel. That'll be your decisions, but and you can talk to us later. But if you let my staff know whether you would sure. want to go separately and have to wait or whether we all go at once and try to cover it that way. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Turning then to our third panel, uh, which will include Danielle Bryan, Executive Director, Project on Government Oversight, and Ronald Tim, President, Rita Security. If you would both stand for the oath, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please let the record uh, note that the witness has responded in the affirmative. Uh, Ms. Brown. Mr. Chairman, I commend you for holding these important hearings. The Project on Government Oversight is an investigative organization that works with inside sources to improve public policy. We're a politically independent nonprofit watchdog that strives to promote government, a government that's accountable to the citizenry. In early 2001, POGO began its investigation into nuclear security at the Department of Energy after more than a dozen high-level departmental security experts came forward with their concerns. We interviewed, after that, current and former DOE security officials, special forces personnel who test security at nuclear facilities, and DOE contractors such as Mr. Tim, who co-authored the report. We now have people contacting us from all over the complex and headquarters. Just prior to September 11, 2001, POGO issued our report, and I ask that it be included in the record, but maybe just the text, because the attachments make it really fat. <laughs> We concluded that the nation's 10 nuclear weapons facilities, which house nearly 1,000 tons of weapons-grade plutonium and highly enriched uranium, regularly fail to protect this material during mock terrorist attacks. Many of these sites are located near metropolitan areas, including the San Francisco Bay Area, Denver, Albuquerque, and Knoxville. There are three major threats to these facilities, and only two were really discussed in the previous uh, testimony. theft radiological sabotage or a dirty bomb, or as Mr. Shays has made reference to, the possibility of terrorists creating an improvised nuclear device, a sizable nuclear detonation within minutes. In full scope mock terrorist attack tests performed by the government at DOE facilities, half the time mock terrorists are successful in breaking in, stealing significant quantities of special nuclear material and leaving the site. Theft, however, requires that the terrorist get into the facility and back out with the material a suicidal terrorist would not have to work that hard. Instead, a successful suicidal terrorist attack doesn't require getting out again and could create a dirty bomb or a sizable nuclear detonation at the facility itself. For example, in October 2000, there was a mock attack test of security at Technical Area 18, a facility at Los Alamos. The mock terrorists successfully entered the facility and the guard force could not get them out. The mock terrorists had enough time to have been able to create a sizable nuclear detonation. A recent CIA pamphlet summarizing devices of interest to Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups highlighted both dirty bombs and improvised nuclear devices as two of their greatest concerns. <coughs> we believe the single most important element to improve security at the nuclear weapons facilities is a realistic design basis threat. Twenty months after 9-11, DOE finally substantially increased the design basis threat at level one sites. Unfortunately, the upgrades will not be fully implemented until 2009, which is eight years after 9-11. The other nuclear weapons sites, however, still have a long way to go, and the new design basis threat for them is wholly inadequate. Special operations personnel expect a terrorist attack on one of these facilities to be with a squad-sized unit. The Army Special Forces size a squad at 12 people, and the Navy SEALs size a squad at four atta 14 attackers. 
The way we understand it, even under the new design basis threat for these level two facilities, which have improvised nuclear device vulnerabilities, DOE will only be protecting against far fewer attackers. Currently, DOE is determining its security requirements based on how much money it is willing to spend on security. And this is backwards. Now, I heard uh, Ambassador Brooks saying that that wasn't true, but I would bring your attention to the testimony of the GAO on page 14, where they said, the DOE and NNSA officials from all levels told us that concern over resources played a large role in developing the 2003 DBT, with some officials calling the DBT the funding basis threat, or the maximum threat the department could afford. This tension between threat size and resources is not a new development." End quote. Hopefully, the committee can encourage DOE to determine its security needs based on the intelligence community's postulated threat in your closed session. We keep seeing evidence of security failures even without an attack on these facilities. All three of the weapons labs have had serious management and security problems in just the last few months. Again, uh, Ambassador Brooks suggested these were not security problems, but let me describe some of them. Top security officials at both Los Alamos and Livermore have been replaced. Only six months ago, what began as a management scandal involved security issues, invo including over 300 stolen or missing computers that the IG testified before Congress may have contained classified information. Now we have missing plutonium there. At Livermore, a set of keys and a security card to access sensitive areas were missing for weeks without being reported. And that's not a security problem? In addition, members of the Livermore SWAT team claim they cannot defend the lab in the event of a terrorist attack. At Sandia, there has also been a series of security lapses, including guards sleeping and keys missing, that are being investigated by Senator Grassley. These scandals, I'd like to point out, have never been discovered by DOE. They've only been brought forward by outsiders. And with the reference to there not being retaliation, when you're talking about these particular instances, you can look at the Los Alamos investigators who were fired after their findings were revealed internally, not to the press, as example of retaliation that does happen. The scattering of special nuclear materials across the country is a leftover from the Cold War. Now, a number of sites have virtually no national security <coughs> mission. However, they continue to store and try to protect tons of nuclear material at great cost. However, DOE has resisted many consolidation opportunities as it would threaten fiefdoms and potentially even lead to the closing down of facilities. In addition to requiring a design basis threat that will address improvised nuclear device vulnerabilities, POGO makes the following recommendations. Consolidation of nuclear materials. The Base Realignment and Closure Commission should be empowered to recommend closing the unneeded and redundant DOE sites, as well as those sites that have no national defense mission. Another solution would be to consolidate nu nuclear materials to fewer, more easily protected sites. These solutions save money and reduce the risk to the public. Under Secretary Robert Card himself recently advised that the first question for a site to consider is, is there a way to reduce the targets by consolidating material, or even better, exporting material to other more permanent or hardened sites? And I have the letter if you need that. This is certainly commendable language. However, these same, direct, same directions have been issued to the field for more than 20 years with little or no impact. A case in point, again, is Los Alamos's Technical Area 18. In 2000, Secretary Richardson directed the site to be de-inventoried of its special nuclear materials by 2003. It was to be moved underground to a currently empty and hardened underground facility at the Nevada test site. Here we are, and not one gram has moved in that direction. Ambassador Brooks's recent predecessor has also pushed to expedite moving the materials out of TA-18, apparently to no avail. I believe Los Alamos is betting on turnover at DOE headquarters and the inattention of the Congress. I would also like to challenge earlier testimony that the security tests are no longer seriously dumbed down. I have examples from last month. Last month, during a mock theft scenario, terrorists were not allowed to go out the same hole in the fence they came in, requiring them to run all the way around the fence line to leave the facility. If they had been allowed to use the hole, they would have been able to leave the facility without even having engaged any of the protective forces. In another recent example, 
the mock terrorists were required to stay on the road in order to leave the facility. In addition, as was pointed out, advanced warning is given to sites, often months in advance, that a test is scheduled, and the tests, as we've mentioned, follow scripts of what the terrorists can and can't do. The three advantages a terrorist has are surprise, speed, and violence of action, elements that are not factors in these dumbed-down tests, yet the mock terrorists still accomplish their mission all too often. Immobilize excess plutonium. Over 50 tons of our plutonium has already been declared excess and could be immobilized making it less attractive for theft. One way to counter DOE's anti-security culture is to move security oversight out of DOE. One suggestion is to move the Independent Oversight Office to uh, model something like the uh, Defense Nuclear Safety Facility Board, where he's not having to report directly to the Secretary. Another option would be to make security oversight at DOE facilities a DOD responsibility, perhaps under the Nuclear Command and Control staff. Increase security funding, but spend resources more efficiently. The United States spends over $1 billion annually on security at DOE sites. We are not getting our money's worth. We're spreading our resources inefficiently by protecting sites we should not have to protect, either because special nuclear materials are not needed there or it's not needed there in massive quantities. Clearly, the new DBT will require more money, but money should not be thrown at the problem without evidence that a real plan to implement security upgrades efficiently is in place. Um, I'd like to point out that in the past, DOE security has hit obstacles obtaining increased budgets from within the department, OMB, and from Congress, in large part because they've simply lied about the status of security. For example, in early 2002, then NNSA Administrator Gordon wrote a letter to the Washington Post denying D Pogo's findings and assuring the public that security was adequate at the nuclear sites. One month later, DOE was talking out the other side of their mouth, begging OMB and the Congress for a half billion dollar increase in funding because of dire security problems. Finally, more congressional oversight. Without sustained and intensive scrutiny and oversight, DOE briefings and testimony will not reveal the actual status of security. It is ultimately up to Congress to keep at this, and I believe it is some of the most important work that you'll do. Here's a suggestion for a next step. In mid-2002, the Scowcroft Commission finally issued their end-to-end -end review of security at DOD and DOE nuclear weapons facilities. We encourage the committee to obtain copies of the draft of that report and interview the authors. I, if I could, because I'm not going to be in the uh, closed session, if I could just make two more uh, mentions from previous out, so testimony. Conclude, yes, conclude. I just wanted to say we already know what's wrong. Ambassador Brooks has said we need more reviews. But the last administration, for example, created the position of security czar headed by an Air Force general with no obvious improvement. I would humbly suggest that roles and responsibilities are periodically rearranged, but we still aren't protecting our nuclear materials against the real terrorist threat, and it's going to take congressional serious oversight to make sure it happens. Thank you for your inviting me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Tim. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank you and the subcommittee for inviting me to give my professional opinion on the state of security at the nuclear weapons facilities in the Department of Energy. I look forward to presenting you to a national security problem that only Congress can solve and that has potential consequences equivalent to that of 9-11. I prepared some slides as we were out of a different room before, but uh, you could read along with those, which may be of help when I go through mine because uh, uh, there are technical things I'll refer to. According to the committee's letter of invitation sent to me, you said the purpose of the hearing was to determine the adequacy of security in the Department of Energy. In fact, this morning a couple of times you've asked a question about adequate security. The term expression adequate is a layperson's term. The department has very prescriptive definitions of risk for the consequence of loss of nuclear materials and risk to the health and safety of the public. Risk in a vulnerability analysis report is developed as a quantitative value that is in turn provided adjectival designations of high, moderate, or low. When a site is determined to be at high risk, compensatory measures must be implemented by orders within 24 hours. A simple red flag you should look for in description of risk is adequate, which is in fact an obfuscation of the risk state. Based on past Department of Energy policy and management and my current activities in the department, I fear that we remain at high risk today. I urge you to look into this critical concern. I further urge you not to accept the canned response, we fixed it without clear verification. In fact, I heard the typical of that this morning by saying they have 18-month-old data. The people who long tolerated and even abetted the failings in the department are still there with no one else to oversee their actions. 
You have asked what have the assessments shown? The assessments, particularly the headquarters quality assurance team's efforts, documented high risk at certain sites. When, for example, from 1997 to 2000, I was principal author for over 200 classified and unclassified letters and reports prepared by the quality assurance team that identified high risk to three major DOE facilities with tons of highly enriched uranium and plutonium holdings. And if you look at slide two, you will see that QA group was made up of headquarters personnel. It was made up of personnel senior from my company, the Sandia National Laboratory simulation personnel, and the Army Special Forces testing people that do force on force testing. Altogether, there was something like 20 people involved with that. The assessments included the theft of special nuclear materials and sabotage resulting in either an improvised nuclear device or a radiological dispersal device. At that time, I personally briefed the findings of high risk to the Department of Energy Directors Joe Mahaley and Toby Johnson. Neither one acted in accordance with the Department of Energy orders. Some of these same issues were briefed to Secretary Richardson and they were staffed down to the same two persons and nothing was done to address the vulnerabilities. Members of the Quality Assurance Team surmised that what happened to these instances was that OSS, now the Office of Security, floated the issues to the two responsible program offices, Defense Programs and Environmental Management, where there was immediate reluctance to address the issue. There was continuous foot dragging by each of these program offices in regards to evaluating the consequences of loss of nuclear materials or the definitions and characteristics of the design basis threat. For example, when developing a worst case scenario, the quality assurance team would often assume to arm the terrorists with 50 caliber sniper rifles with armor piercing incendiary rounds. The program officers would argue that this was unfair to the protective forces. Regularly, the program officers would balk at the high risk determination at a site because if they were to acknowledge the state of risk, they would have to fix it while immediately instituting compensatory measures that would divert funds from programmatic efforts. To paraphrase a recent quote from Steve Wallace at the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, what seems to have evolved is that higher level decision makers came to the conclusion that there isn't a security issue, in part based on an analysis done by analysts who sort of wanted low risk. How is risk assessed? And this is where you're not want to go to follow me a lot because you've seen an equation on that one. But basically, uh, risk is assessed by a simple equation called R equals C times T times 1 minus protection effectiveness. And the term consequence is the value of the consequence of loss of theft or sabotage of nuclear materials and danger to the health and safety of the public. The T value is, in fact, the design basis threat and describes what all the attributes and characteristics of the terrorist are. And PE is a value that basically is the protection elements that you're talking about on a site. It's made up detection, delay, and response. And if you look at that, there's some funny arrows on it. If you remember from your days back in algebra, one side of the equation goes up, the other side of the equation has to go up in order to remain balanced, with the exception of the 1 minus PE. In order to get better protection to reduce risk, to reduce risk, you have to get better protection coming up. And that's what we're here talking about. Is protection adequate to keep the risk low in the department? In and of itself, the equation for risk is algebraically simple, perhaps deceptively so. For example, in physics, the equations developed by Newton and Einstein, F equal MA and E equal MC squared, are also simple. However, one determines space flight and one develops nuclear weapons. The risk equation of the Department of Energy is used to determine the protection required for the assets of societal importance. That is the theft or sabotage of nuclear materials from national inventory under the stewardship of the Department of Energy. 19 months after the September 11th attack, a new design basis threat was finally issued at the end of May. A draft version had been circulated on 1231 that included an increase in the number of terrorists and a lowering of the numerical value for risk. The draft design basis statements would have approved one failure in every 20 attacks at the low risk. That means every time they tried 20 times, it was succeeded once, and that was the standard they wanted to move to. Today's new design basis threat that was approved less than three weeks ago has a much higher rate of loss. It is the same rate of loss used before 9-11 attacks. On 9-11, the terrorists succeeded in three out of four attempts, either in addition to the number of size of terrorists or the decrease in the approved low risk would result in a linear increase in the size of the protective force for a given site. By making just one change in the design basis threat, the security improvements are simplified. 
Even with the new and simple change of the design basis threat, the necessary improvements to security are not required to be completed until 2009, with the actual improvements to be sometimes later. Sometimes on physical security, you'll approve the money, and it will not be turnkeyed until three years later. So the question that was asked before about are we going to still be talking about this in 2008 and 2010 is an extremely li high likelihood based on what we had in tr past track records. I have talked about the risk to nuclear weapons complex in the department and the risk of health and safety of the public, as well as the corrective actions for approved design basis threat. But how do we fix it? There is no quick fix in the department that has been dysfunctional as long as this department has, but there are corrective steps to improvement the process, and they are. You must hold senior managers in the department accountable for their actions. Many of the current managers in the department knew and know about high risk of nuclear inventory from theft or sabotage, and they were given thousands of pages of classified reports documenting the high risk. To date, reorganization of the department to include NSA has only rearranged the deck chairs. We need to replace these people with qualified personnel. The bureaucrats in place protect one another. You can't expect friends to fire one another. In this case, only the Congress can affect that change. Top leaders should be held accountable. Their actions should put their careers on the line. Today, one of the aforementioned Department of Energy directors has been given an award, and the other is at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory looking at a security failure for the lost keys. What we need are qualified personnel with experience in loss prevention, not simply retired military personnel whose experience is in national defense or law enforcement. In fact, I viewed with some amusement uh, Secretary Brooks saying that I'm bringing in Admiral this and Admiral that. We have had Air Force generals come in. They are national defense experts or they are law enforcement experts. They are not loss prevention experts. And so that in itself, they, in fact, we've seen them walk out the site and say, they've got big guns at this site. You walk out with a dirt-faced, Special Forces guys, and he will show you what a big gun can do to some of those people that are walking around out there. The second recommendation is consolidate the manuka materials, and that was pretty much what uh, Danielle had, and I agree with that. We have seen plans put in place by the previous to have decision directives to move materials. Malicious compliance is being done by the department that says we still haven't moved it today. The other last item that is most important from your perspective is providing line item funding for physical security at the level of a program office to include the operating dollars designated for increased protective force size and capabilities. Today, the Department of Homeland Security has a budget of greater than $30 billion. However, Department of Energy Management resists spending money on security. If they establish a new 24-7 post or a patrol for protective force at any of the 10 Class A sites, this is equal to about five full-time protective force personnel, which is the same cost as two or three scientists. Therefore, the scientists must be laid off to hire the security personnel, not a popular option. The program offices have an inherent conflict of interest when deciding to improve security and lower risk or lay off scientists. In conclusion, let me summarize my testimony. Many of the nuclear weapon facilities in the Department of Energy are at risk, which endangers the health and safety of the public. This has been documented continuously since March 1997. The security of the nation's nuclear stockpile has been mischaracterized as adequate by senior career, career personnel within the department. The corrections and remedies for the existing problems fall to Congress for action. Thank you very much. Thank you both of you. We'll have a, a five-minute round of questions, beginning with uh, Chairman Chase. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Bryan, I, I uh, appreciated uh, uh, your, I appreciated both your testimony. I, I appreciated your testimony in terms of, of helping us raise some questions uh, behind the closed door. Some of them, frankly, we could have raised uh, uh, not behind closed doors. And I, and I kind of, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we should have asked about the issue of intimidation and so on. and, and so it will be put on the record uh, behind the closed doors, but, but it is not really confidential information. I, um, I want to – I wrote down that what I was trying to wrestle with, a breach uh, in, in terms of the force-by-force force exercise, a breach success, a facility is vulnerable. We can know that if, if you're going to tell them that you're going to attack and you allow both sides to plan for the offense and defense, 
and you still succeed in getting through, you got a big problem. That's, that's how we see it. A non-breach does not suggest the facility is not vulnerable because they have been warned. That was kind of what I was wrestling with and suggesting. I thought that was a great point you were making, and I thought I you didn't make it well, though. But well, make I, it again I made in the closed session. Okay. <laughs> but I think that actually what you were encountering was important. You saw the defense of the status quo on the part of Mr. Mahaley in not wanting to, and when you said, why are you disagreeing with me? I mean, I yeah. thought that was a really important yeah. dialogue that you had with him, that, that at DOE, they don't want to acknowledge weaknesses in the, the way the system works. Right. How many, in terms of your information, how many uh, breached, uh, how many times in the last few years do, have we been able to breach a facility? Our understanding is that uh, over 50 percent of the time, the mock terrorists in full up, this means the independent uh, full DOE assessments, not the self-assessments that are done by the labs for themselves or the facilities for yeah. themselves, but in the, in the big full up ones, more than 50 percent of the time, the mock terrorists are successful at achieving their mission, whether it be theft or creating, as we discussed before, um, you know, the improvised nuclear device, whatever their mission is. And based on yours, uh, and both of you could respond to this, based on uh, your work and research and knowledge, where, what uh, facilities do you think are the most vulnerable? I can't know that because I don't have a clearance. And the only uh, examples that I know of are those that have been, the, the, the uh, security failures have been fixed, and that's the way I'm able to know those. But I can specifically speak to one facility, TA-18, which has been identified by the last two administrations as being the most vulnerable. It's at Los Alamos. And as I mentioned, uh, Secretary uh, Richardson ordered that it be de-inventoried of all of its special nuclear materials by now. <laughs> And none of it has moved out yet. Uh, and there's all kinds of excuses coming from Los Alamos, we're not ready yet. And uh, this administration actually uh, issued a stern warning that they needed to get the stuff out. It's in a canyon. So the high ground, the bad guys can have the high ground. And we all know from, you know, cowboys and Indians that that's not the where you want to be storing special nuclear materials. In fact, one of the characteristic stories of that site was the fact that they dumbed down the test and told the Special Forces people when they were stealing material, I think it was in 97, that they couldn't use a vehicle and they went and brought in a garden cart because that wasn't prohibited and then they were able to steal the material and they yelled foul that it was not a reasonable test because they used a garden cart to drag away the SNM. So that's some of the artificiality that you see go into those force on force yeah. tests. Force on force tests are not cheap, sir. They run anywhere between $100,000 and a quarter million dollars to pull one up and run it, and labs are very reluctant to go ahead and put that kind of money into it. I, I happen to think they are tremendously important, yeah. uh, but not to enable the department to say that we've done this so now that we're, we know this facility is safe. It's a wonderful tool for, for everyone to know the vulnerabilities and how they can then try to prevent them in the future. If you were to ask uh, any of the participants in the closed-door session a question. Uh, what, give me your, 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 your top few, both of you. Well, the one that I wrote down that I wish I could ask, uh, is when you were asking, um, I think it was maybe you, Mr. Tierney, who asked uh, Ambassador Brooks, um, do you believe that uh, you have been able to reach denial? In other words, the ability to stop the terrorists from coming into the site? And he said, absolutely, yes, we have reached that capacity. And you asked, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, because of this force on force test. I would encourage you to ask um, Mr. Podonsky or the GAO whether force on force tests of denial have been run at all of these facilities and whether it has been successful in preventing uh, the terrorists from getting in. I don't believe the answer would support Mr. Uh, Brooks, uh, <coughs> Ambassador Brooks's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Tim. I think I would ask the question about how much have they actually done performance testing against the RDD, the radiological dispersal device. On that one, you take a weapon of mass destruction, a, a truck, and in fact, their truck bomb size is classified, but if you talk to the technical security working group for the Department of Defense, they classify that as a 60,000-pound vehicle. And if you park it next to a building, which we postulated outside of Denver and blew that up, you would basically have taken that plutonium and wafted it over the city of Denver. And so the question is, do they really test weapons of mass destruction to, in fact, implement an RDD at those specific sites? Uh, we would find vehicle barriers on wrong fences, so in fact the bad guy could cut them without anyone even watching them, and then drive that 18-wheeler right up alongside of a, of a building. That's all you have I, to I, do. I missed what you said. Say that more slowly. You did what? We postulated driving an 18-wheeler right up next to a building and exploding it with whatever poundage of high explosives on it, which would then waft the 
plutonium in this particular site up into the air and it would have blown over the city of Denver. Right. And they'd not test against the RDD, is my, my best knowledge, and I work in the department yet actively today. Oh, we'll, we'll check that out as well. Um, any other questions you, you think it would be wise to ask? If you would submit them to our staff before uh, uh, 2 o'clock today, um, I think we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you both very much. Thank I you. appreciate your work and appreciate your testimony. And, and uh, my only disappointment was that uh, you pointed out a question or two that we could have asked in public that I wish we had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank both of you for your testimony. My only regret is that we didn't arrange this testimony differently and have you folks testify first so that we would have been able to see the reaction and the, and the commentary from the others in a public session, at least as much as we could. And I might uh, recommend to uh, my colleagues on the other side that we all go back and think about the way we uh, structure these witnesses from time to time, because that might be helpful and uh, hopefully that is something we'll consider. You know, I get concerned because when we had the hearings on the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the protection of nuclear power plants, we heard the same stuff. Right. You know, that the, uh, the inadequate force-to-force uh, -force test, uh, the inadequate threat design, uh, and it goes on and on. And I know I get criticized in my area from the people in the nuclear industry who keep thinking that we're being uh, overly aggressive in our research with them and that they think they're all safe. But when you visit those plants, you see all the things that the tests show. We hear port security commentary. We still haven't uh, even set the idea of what we need to do to prioritize what can be done, although we all know uh, from other independents that have done that that we could do things. Uh, we know that still that, what, 42 percent of the cargo and passenger planes is uh, not screened, and it uh, is incredible. And we still know that uh, we don't have a proper communications coordination system going around here, although all those things are available. And I, I know that uh, others are, and I are putting together a system of where we should be in all those points at a certain time, and hopefully we can hold this administration uh, to that point, because it really gets to the point of ridiculousness when we see what's going on. Uh, Ms. Bryan, you mentioned that we ought to think possibly about putting the Def Department of Defense in charge of security at these facilities. Uh, the current security, obviously, is private individuals, and they're either inept or uh, some other explanation for why they're not doing the job. Uh, but is the Department of Defense going to have the kind of expertise, because Mr. Tim mentioned that sometimes just bringing in the brass uh, doesn't resolve it, or should we go to a wholly separate group of real specialists and establish them to do it? Well, uh, actually, um, what I was suggesting, and perhaps I wasn't clear, was not to have the security itself be run by DOD. I think, actually, posse comitatus may prevent um, us from doing that, but I meant the oversight of, of the um, security. And one way of doing that is, well, there are parts of DOD, not just people who have things on their shoulders, but who are actually trained. And, and one of the uh, many places that we actually briefed with our findings was the Nuclear C Control and Command staff. And it uh, struck me that their job is the security and oversight of the security of the DOD nuclear weapons themselves. And so they already have that level of training and expertise, and they are tremendously critical of DOE. And uh, I frankly thought that perhaps by taking advantage of, to some extent, the interagency rivalries, if you had someone who really was trying to find where the problems are, we would actually improve security. Is this a question of the Department of Energy knowing what they should have to do and not being willing to spend the money or appropriate the resources to it, or is this just a question of flat out incompetence? I think maybe it's both of those plus uh, a level of uh, bureaucratic inertia that people don't want to change the way they've done things and they certainly don't want to admit that they've been wrong. Uh, you have a lot of the same people in place. As Mr. Tim mentioned, when the NNSA was created, we actually have as an attachment to our report um, the press release announcing the new NNSA and the people who were going to be in this new job. Well, they were all the same people who had been at the DOE defense programs and they just changed their title. So. Um, I think a lot of it is, frankly, people who are still there and don't want to, uh, you know, who sort of dig in the heels and say, no, the outside critics are wrong, we know what we're doing. So I think that's a lot of it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, can we have that POGO report uh, made a part of the record with unanimous consent? Sir, 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 without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, just the um, threat design basis. Mr. Tim, you, you started to talk about that a little bit. Can you give me your evaluation of that most recent document? 
I think uh, there was a characterization that it was what money could buy. Uh, the one they had on 1231, uh, the draft one, in fact, I thought was aggressive. I thought it was responsive, and I thought it did meet the mark on that. And I was surprised at the robustness of it uh, because they uh, uh, increased not only the number of, of, of terrorists coming, but also said we're going to accept less risk at the site. And that was an important uh, uh, element that they added to that. Uh, it was going to have people have to change a lot of ways they think as regards to it. You just can't throw people at the problem anymore. You've got to get a lot smarter than what they do. And so uh, uh, they basically, uh, uh, again, we've beaten to death the word dumbed down, but they basically dialed it down to where it was an acceptable uh, uh, function. And you think they did that for financial uh, reasons? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely. It's, it's no question that they had to because of the amount of, of, of manpower you would have had to bring to bear or even changes in tactics that you would have had to accomplish within that function. Thank you both for your testimony. It's valuable to us. Thank okay. you, sir. Well, in looking at your testimony, Ms. Bryan, when you <clears throat> indicated the uh, options that could be pursued, the one, obviously, with the Department of Defense having responsibility is the one I think that um, intuitively most people would uh, arrive at um, and maybe even begin there. If you ask people who is guarding um, th these facilities, I think most people's perceptions would be that the military is and not that we have the Department of Energy or even contractors uh, that are, are, are uh, participating in that. Um, uh, Mr. Tim, in looking at, at your testimony, uh, um, you state that one of the concerns that you have is that um, what we need are qualified persons with experience in loss prevention, not simply retired military personnel whose experience is in national defense or law enforcement. I mean, that, that obviously seems like, like a conflict, um, and I'd just like you guys to discuss that for a moment, because it would seem to me, um, Ms. Bryan, that your, your, your statement is, is one that is, um, as you went through what the Department of Defense does in security and other facilities, it seems like this would be um, a natural uh, fit, and if you uh, both would discuss that issue. I don't think we're in disagreement at all. It may have been the wording that we chose on this. Uh, uh, the Department of Defense, as far as command structure, ability to train and have people available to do that, is obviously a ready source of manpower. Uh, at Livermore Laboratory, it took them a year and a half to reconstitute their SRT after they had disbanded it in 95. And so I don't see a problem with that. The problem you have when I talked about bringing command structure people in here is they bring in the military aspect of how they look at it, and it's a national defense perspective rather than a loss prevention. I've worked with many competent uh, people out of the Defense Department that are perfectly capable of doing this within the construct of what you're trying to put together. And so I don't believe we're in that. It's just a matter of the, the devil's in detail as far as pulling these two together. And I, I think also um, the distinction is rather than having someone at the top who has not had experience actually protecting assets but has another entirely different, as was suggested, their admirals who I think were um, strategic, strategic command experience. It's not the same kind of military experience that many of the special forces. For example, there's a unit uh, out of Fort Bragg that is trained of the special operations, uh, that is trained specifically as adversaries. And that's what they do. And they go to different sites and train and uh, try to breach security. And those are the kinds of people that we're talking about being involved, rather than people who have uh, a military career but has nothing to do with actual, you know, entering being pretend terrorists, mock terrorists, or, you know, protecting assets. In fact, the experience I had personally was with a one-star general who was head of the MPs that retired and went to the Department of Energy at Oak Ridge. And uh, uh, I spent quite some time explaining the R equation to him so that he understood. And we would walk out there and test up. He said, well, show me what you mean, Ron, by doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, we would cross fence lines and find out the defense line didn't work the way it was supposed to, and he would immediately stop and go into compensatory modes. We one time stole some material out of it. It was gone over the fence in 34 seconds. But that command general was capable of dropping back and saying, this is what I don't know, and this is what I need to know about loss prevention. So it's not to say they're dumb at all. It's to say their experience is not in the area of loss prevention. It's in national defense. Very good. Well, as you know, we're going to be adjourning uh, to uh, a closed session at 2 p.m. Do you have anything else that you would like to uh, add uh, so for I, us? As I understand it, I'm invited to 2 o'clock session because I have a clearance. Yes, my statement to you was, do you have anything else no, that, that you want to point. add in this public portion of, of the meeting? We look forward to seeing you.
Thank you. Thank I look forward to coming. Great. Thank you. I ask for unanimous consent that the subcommittee meet in closed session at 2 p.m. today to hear testimony on classified aspects of the issues under discussion today. And without objection, it is so ordered. Thank you. C-SPAN 2, another chance to see last night's segment of our special on rebuilding Iraq. It looks at U.S. efforts in Baghdad 